really excited to be going live right now in all the places, uh, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. And I'm about to bring on the legendary Kent Kreitler for this episode of Showing Up. So thank you for joining me. I created this podcast to help us all show up, kind of step into our own unique, weird, do the thing, even if we suck at it, and fully show up for this one wild and precious life. Uh, there are a few of us that really have embodied that, and Kent Kreitler is one of those people. Uh, in terms of pioneering our sport, uh, pushing skis, pushing uh, the evolution of a, a, an industry at all, um, kind of out of out of nothing, with a group of renegade skiers who pioneered Alaska and have created this, uh, you know, this industry we call free skiing. So um, I am bringing Kreitler on in all the places. Um, this is the hardest part. Looking for him. Uh, let's see on Instagram. Can you see it, Kent? I'm gonna bring him on 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 YouTube. Boom, live there. Um, can you see me on Insta? No. Yes. <laughs> Technology. It's it's good for a lot of things. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm looking here. Doesn't matter what. Can you go to my page and then, um, and then click there? Sure. Let me look. Uh, uh, this is where the the part where I'm supposed to have like good dad jokes. Okay, you're live. You. So do I hit this live button in the corner? Yeah, hit hit that, and then it'll ask you, uh, "Would you like to join?" Um, uh. I could ask you if you and I a badge to support Lindsay Dyer. A request to join. There we go. There we go. No um, do you have any good jokes you have off the top of your head? That's pretty funny. Um, no, I'm horrible at jokes. I'm. Yeah, that I've just sense. never been like I don't know when it, I know I yeah. Let me think. I do a lot. I joke around a lot. Like I'm actually really goofy, but I don't. I don't memorize jokes very well. Yeah. I hear that. Um, did you see that? Oh yeah, it's working. We are now live in two places. Sweet. Um, there, there you go. Yeah. Go with glasses off for a while here. So uh, let's check in. Like, where are you coming from? What did you do this morning? <laughs> um, I'm in Ketchum, Idaho, where I returned to uh, about nine years ago from Squaw or from Palisades. And um, I am working this morning. I'm a realtor and I also have a more exciting uh, development project in Panama that's been in the works for many years, like 17 years. And it's so slow moving, getting things done down there, but we're finally getting very close to um, having the entitlements on the land development. And then uh, they're doing some really uh, cool home design and we're working on the hotel project. So not skiing today. They closed our mountain and there's still tons of snow. I can see it from here. Um, so we're kind of in the spring term interim of kind of lacking events, except I'm considering learning how to skate ski since I've never done that. I think I'd actually probably enjoy it. Yeah, uh, it's that that awkward like end of the season, dare we say, depression <laughs> i know and, right and it's at the same time it's like that's good you know at the same time it gives people like me a chance to you know follow up on these podcasts that i've been wanting to do all winter and kind of go more internal this is usually when i make my art so what have you always done in this seasonal depression time <laughs> <laughs> shift or whatever you want to call it um i mean i loved living in palisades because it's the spring riding is the best for park skiing. I feel bad for the kids and, you know, like in Jackson and here when these mountains close so early, cause it just gets like the best in spring. So yeah, we haven't even had spring yet. <laughs> I know. Right. Um, yeah. I had like three days of corn. Um, Lucky you. I don't know. Right now I'm working a bunch and going to the gym and I should start doing yoga again. And uh, 
contemplating putting my skins on and doing a little bit of uh some excursions this spring but i haven't even gotten there yet just kind of like hit me end of the season was sunday here so catching up on work to be honest i skied so much pow this year and had so many great days and i kind of still prioritize skiing over things that i should be doing that are more responsible so um yeah Refocusing on work and responsibilities also a parent so parenting always i guess there's this idea in my head that was like maybe i'm going to grow up soon and i will prioritize those things that are important <laughs> and uh and not need to see so much and to hear you <clears throat> saying that you prioritize that even now that's um not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> that what I prioritize prioritize what? Oh, skiing. skiing. No, there's like this great. I think it was like a Klaus Obermeyer quote, but I kind of stole part of it because I didn't really know what it was, and I never actually heard him quote it. But it was like, you can never get back the days that you don't. You can never get. You can never get back the days that you don't ski. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. I like that. Yeah. I'll take yeah. it. So tell yeah, me about I, your winter. Like what? What does your life look like now? Um, pretty much like I do a lot of, um, in terms of skiing, I don't. No, I, like I'm, life across the board. Like what's a. Oh, what's life? Like, well, I don't know, what, what did your winter look like day to day? I skied a lot. I, I'm being totally honest. I, 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 ta I, I take like at least like a two or three hour chunk as long as there was POW. And there's usually somewhere i can go find powder um without upsetting too many people there's probably hardly anyone from sun valley watching this but um we're kind of known as this r resorty groomer mountain but we actually have open boundaries and we have like it, you know it's not like jackson where there's like hundreds of people going out of bounds um or interested in going out of bounds. Like it's literally like me and like a group of guys that I ski with and like one or two other groups. And then that, yeah. So, I mean, I honestly, not to brag, but kind of, kind of crush it all the time without even hiking. <laughs> I mean, some traversing and. Well, yeah. and, and what does it look like with your daughter? Are you taking her to school? Like, what's that routine? Yeah, well, so kids are great, and she's really fun. So she goes to school, and that's 8 to 2.30, and then she has afternoon programs, or she has ski teams. So, you know, there's moving moving her around, and then we're always together in the evenings. Um, and then at this time, she's with her mom and me week on, week off. So doing that and then she's going to be with me full time in September so we'll see what that looks like but she's she's 10 now so she's getting pretty um independent and I happen to live like right in the core of Ketchum which makes parenting really easy I live about a couple hundred yards from Hemingway and then lots of activities so it's honestly relatively relatively easy and fun without you know too much driving and then and then you're working on this Panama project that's been a while. In yeah, the process. I've been working on Panama for 17 years, and I think I've had to jump every Central American hurdle you've ever heard of. Um, but we're really close to having the entitlements, which means that my land approvals on two of the master plans will be approved by the government. And um, that's taken a lot of time because most it just takes time. And like pretty much no one else in my area is doing things the legal way. And I'm not exactly sure how they're able to subdivide and do all the things they're doing, but I'm doing it the legal way. And um, yeah, it takes time. And then I've had to title property and I've had people, I've had some issues with some people a long time ago, but trying to like take property from me. And, and uh, yeah, things move slow. It's pretty analog, so not a lot of just digitized. Like I'm a realtor here in Sun Valley and everything's digitized. Like you can look up anyone's land, find out who owns what, look at look at their maps, look up uh, their tech, if they paid their taxes. I mean, you can look up everything really <clears throat> quite easily. And um, 
like everything still paper maps any kind of contract has to be notarized and there's one notary in each town so like even just getting a notar getting something notarized can take hours and just waiting in line so so anyway things move pretty slow down there but is there also any like localism in terms of you know who gets um yeah well, yeah panamanians are pretty nationalistic but they're also like my community i was for i was there 17 years ago so i'm like pr at this point like there's been a ton of inner when i first went there it was like it was a cowboy they're cowboys like in my part of panama they're ranchers cowboys and so um it was basically a cowboy town uh, close to the beach and then now 17 years later all my like a lot of my friends there have intermarried and then like different people from may it's a lot of north americans and canadians and then and it's not that big of a community but also like europeans and other people have moved there so there's been like a lot more integration and um modernization i guess you'd call it um yeah there I, wasn't I, like an indigenous there were there weren't indigenous people in this area it was basically like spanish ranchers who had been there for whatever generations since the 1700s 1800s and so 1900 I, early 1900s i definitely wanted to get into this but um you know to give people a little bit of background first but since we're here let's just keep going and then uh if uh and then i'll come back or we can come back with background most people that would be interested in this talk uh know who kent kreitler is as an athlete um and of course i just want to talk to you and we just want to talk about what's going on now but a, a lot of people you know want to hear backstories that have been uh you know brought up a lot in some really cool films and and podcasts uh and it's really cool to hear what you're excited about now i mean just to stay with this how did you find this place in panama is it like hot water or cold water is it a left or a right like um tell me that <laughs> so it's on a so the property's on a surf break called corto circuito with the right river mouth point break and um i got there a friend of mine I don't know if you, well, Lindsay's originally from Ketchum, but I don't know if you ever remember the guy named Brad Martin, but he's my age. And I didn't really know Lindsay growing up because I'm a lot older, but <clears throat> um, Brad from here ended up having property there. He was like the first foreigner and uh, he kept trying to get me to go down. And this is like in the, in the not, late nineties when I was, you know, doing my skiing thing. And then finally in like 2004, I went down there because I'd been in Costa Rica a bunch of times early on before Costa Rica got super developed. And um, and I went and it was gorgeous. And then I just ended up, I was like, hey, I just wanna buy a lot or a piece, small piece of land. And the only land for sale was this this guy wanted to sell his two or it's like 150 acres. Um, and uh, he wanted 250 grand for it. I have a lot more into it by now, like a lot more. <laughs> Um, and it's been uh, like 15 years. I ended up buying this huge piece of land mm -hmm. 17 years ago, yeah, like in 2005. So go on, you, you bought this land. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up just, yeah, I was still skiing then, but um, I just had this vision of kind of doing a retreat center. And, um, and then, I, yeah, I've just been clearing the obstacles for quite a while. But now fires, yeah. slow, a slow burn yeah, just, fires. Yeah, it's difficult. Like, um, like all my survey, the surveys were, were all quite wrong and I've had to redo all those in some cases several times. And just, yeah, I don't know, things, like I said before, I've taken quite a bit of time. I could go into like a lot of boring details, but. Well, and what keeps you going versus being like, oh, it's too monotonous. Or I would never, if I knew what I was getting into, I would never have done it, but um, it's just been, um, <sighs> well, it's been like a vision of mine to have like a place somewhere warm, like a lot of us. And, um, and then just from a creative side, like it's very creative. It's a really gorgeous piece of land with a lot of mountains and waterfalls. And um, it's fun to work with. Like it's kind of a blank canvas that I get to create on. And um, otherwise, um yeah i mean i just it kind of just was fate like i ended up with this amazing 
probably one of the most gorgeous pieces of land I've ever seen in Central America. And I've just been working on it because I'm like, what am I going to do with my life post skiing? And I do, I, I, I had some early luck in just some real estate that I owned and like my place that I own in Squaw. And I just had a kind of, um, in terms of like getting into something that I thought I could make a living from and also enjoy. Um, yeah, I got, I got, uh, interested in real estate and then it's very creative on the development side. So I feel like I need to be creative or I'm going to be stymied. <laughs> and I mean, you, you got us there. So like, let's go straight to that, the transition then, uh, of like you had essentially were a rock star <laughs> and then chose to like move on yeah um yeah i just i i did 15 years of skiing and i was really burned out i was kind of i was kind of more tired of well i was just i was burned out on several fronts kind of of the industry at that time because during my, for my generation, like every step we took was like trying to get something new out of the industry and like trying to create something out of nothing and get people on board. And, um, I've been doing it for 15 years and, um, and let's like dig into that a little bit. I think people just assume that pro skiers are like these, these just spoiled rich kids that get everything given to them and everything's so easy. And I don't think many people know the amount of professionalism that from whatever it's specifically you really put out there in terms of writing mm -hmm. professional letters all the time, making serious calls, uh, like really committing. So could mm -hmm. you share more of that? Um, it looked like when, cause you yeah, guys well, we had to be quite, uh, well, for one thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I can't speak to, all the different personalities involved now and what everyone's background is. I, I know like even between the time when I was a kid and now it's like much harder to grow up in a ski town. Um, and even the, for parents to fund ski team and everything like that. So I think like the dynamic is different than when, even when you grew up, when it was like these ski towns were kind of like small towns and they weren't incredibly unaffordable and everything else. So <clears throat> Anyway, I came out of here uh, and I was in college and um, I just got reinterested re in skiing. And I actually, we just, we skied like quite a bit in college just for fun. And um, Shane and I were roommates and Shane always wanted to video everything, which if you saw his movie, like he has all these early videos because he was always kind of documenting his life. But I was involved, like, honestly, before him with Spider and Volant Skis because of this early connection. And um, even early on, like, you know, David Steckline and his kids, Drew Steckline, was also a pro skier and he's a great photographer. My, but, my um, dad actually got taken on one of those early photo shoots. <laughs> yeah. So, Dave, so back when I was when when I started being a pro skier, the photographers got all the money and all the product. And the photographers would take skiers if you were good and they'd like put you in clothes for the day and um and you'd go ski and i did that in high school actually quite a bit um and it was great because he paid me 20 bucks an hour and i'd go up and hit this jump like up above the bowls or whatever over and over again doing these what i would i can't use that word um <laughs> doing these uh kooky photo shoots and um <laughs> And so I liked that and I liked performing and being trying to be good on camera. Um, and then that the kind of, and then, you know, we watched ski movies growing up in Sun Valley. We watched Warren Miller and the Dick Barrymore films, like the premieres by them were here every year because, because they were both from this area at that time. So like, that was just a big part of my culture. And, um, and then when we were in college, I, I went off to the 93, us extreme skiing championships and and uh and won <laughs> and that but that was after i'd done a film with nick nixon um and shane was doing the mogul tour and uh 
and I met, you know, Doug Coombs and Jimmy Zell and uh, Jeff Zell and John Hunt and Seth Morrison was in that event and Dave Swanwick was in that event and Dean Cummings and Dean Conway had won the previous year. And so I met that, I got involved in that whole culture, like through that event and um, kind of met everyone the year I went the first time and, and won. And it was, you know, there were whatever, a hundred and something people and it was really fun. And, and was, I, was everybody kind of from Squaw or Jackson or Sun Valley? Like where was everybody coming from? Cause you know, anyone who can do research on you, like has heard about all these guys and you guys is, uh, you know, pioneering this, this world, um, and becoming really sounded like a brotherhood of like, it wasn't you competing against each other. It was, you all knew you were kind of taken a chew at this and you all had to. Yeah. Where was everybody? Yeah. So we're going back. To, so that, so we go, if we circle back to what you're originally asking, um, we had to, really convinced like every time we were pulling any kind of money out of the industry, we we're convincing them of the validity and the value of the sport. Um, so, and how, and how are you doing that? Like, like what you that said, look like? writing letters, making phone calls. Like I was pretty unabashed of just like calling out what I thought was an important future for the sport. And most people wouldn't listen, but you know, you had those early, industry pioneers who did listen and at that time snowboarding was going berserk um and so we were people like me were were saying you know if you're going to compete with snowboarding like this whole everything about skiing was so uncool at the time um i mean at, and we were I've, I'm, I've never been anti-racing, but I've honestly never been very interested in racing. Um, I mean, I watched uh, Peekaboo's movie, who Peekaboo and I grew up on ski team. But w when she was in her prime, I, I had no idea what was going on in her life. I've, I never watched World Cup. I really still don't. I enjoy it when I do watch it. But um, I've watched her movie and I was like, oh, that's so cool. Now I know what was going on with Peekaboo <laughs> back when, when I was doing this stuff but like um it wasn't relatable you know like even now the big mountain teams obviously are are ge are generally the biggest part of most of the ski teams um but so for me as a kid i enjoyed ski racing but then when i got into this stuff to what we're doing now and the extreme extreme skiing was what it was back then and we sort of put the kibosh on that um because we thought it was a goofy word um because everything was at that time all these companies were marketing as extreme 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 so they kind of took away from that word originally came from skiing in terms of being relatable related to a sport but then it got kind of stolen and commandeered by all these kooky companies that were making extreme everything so then we dropped it um, but it seemed to make a ton of money at that time it's that's when it seemed to like become global this idea because that's what a lot yeah. of people remember yeah and just like being extreme and it was like very gen x-y right and so i'm a gen x and so like gen x was like we were very raw and we had like punk music we grew up with punk music and grunge music and like we were very like there was a very like counterculture you know uh very counterculture psychology that was part of our generation and um and uh yeah and it turned into like like caffeine drinks <laughs> yeah right yeah i mean everything <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and that's when that's where all those giant uh like contracts eventually came from <laughs> for like the tanner halls and that sort of thing yeah right yeah i mean those bigger spot some of those uh outside of the industry sponsors came in like red bull and other companies and um that was one of my mistakes is I didn't hook up with Red Bull. I was, with, I was with Jones Soda because my buddy Frankie was like the Jones Soda team manager and Tony Hawk was pushing the Jones Soda thing. And I was like, oh, Jones is going to be so cool. But they didn't, it, that, that thing didn't pan what, out. Right. What well, is I, don't Jones still, I don't know if Jones Soda is still around. What is that? <laughs> it was like a cool soda. And it was like, all oh, Tony Hawk was their main spokesperson. And it was, um, it had a really cool image. It was just started out as this kind of flavored soda thing, but then they had an energy drink and, um, and, uh, they, 
yeah, anyway, it was just, it was, a, I guess they're gone now. I haven't seen it for a while. It's interesting. You only hear about the winners because you don't hear like stories like that very often. Oh my God. Tony, Frank has the Frank. So Frank Barbara worked for, so I started a ski magazine that was the first ski magazine that was a fail because we were too early and we couldn't get advertising. It was called. What Ford, was that called? Oh, Ford sorry. Motion. You started that when? Um, we started right before freeze and we were like, we basically were competing with them to see who could come out with their f issue first. So and, was uh, Jake Witt on which side of that? <laughs> he was with Freeze. And like, I went to the original Freeze meetings and I was like, you guys, let's do this independently. And they were like, they had the whole Times Mirror thing behind them, which um, for them was a wiser decision. <laughs> but I was very independently minded. Like I was very, um, well, I mean, it's good to have those big backers, but like those companies that produce ski and ski magazine were so like, like held us down for so long. What, like they could have, they wouldn't get involved. And then finally, like they were going to do it. And I was like, screw those guys. They haven't supported us for the last four years that we've been trying to carry this torch. Um, and then, and so we'd already been formulating like the whole magazine thing ahead of, when those initial freeze discussions came into play. So um, we just continued on our track, which was, it was fun and creative and we had some good times, but we all, <laughs> we all ended up losing money and doing a ton of work for free, but it helped. I mean, in the, in the end, it helped promote the sport for several years. For two years, we were in business. I think we did four issues. I didn't know, I didn't know that at all. That's amazing. It's so cool to start to really see your full creative spectrum. Hmm. And then also how driven you are you know, in whatever it is. And that's exhausting. Yeah, you've got to do it all by yourself. <laughs> no, I keep getting involved in these pioneering missions. So the ski thing was really, you can't it was, help it. it's pretty, it's pretty exhausting being a pioneer. The pioneers take the arrows, oh you know, my God, do I. and I did it in Panama again. And finally, like that's coming to fruition. And, um, and that'll be like, you know, something that I can actually stick with for the, for the rest of my life. Um, but yeah, it was tough. And then I, yeah, I haven't taken the easy road for the most part. I grew, I grew up in a family that had money and then, you know, I got cut off and then, you know, I was on my, I've been on my own ever since I got cut off. And, um, and, uh, yeah, my parent, yeah, my parents are both gone. And, um, and, um, like my dad was kind of the money side of the family. They weren't together, but, um, he didn't leave anything to his kids. He just was more like the, um, he like gave it all away to, which is great. He gave it away to like whatever. So I've just like been bootstrapping it here. But I had or early on, I was really well supported. Like as a kid growing up, ski racing, I, I did go to like summer ski camps and had a really good opportunity as a kid. Uh, but then ever since I got into the ski thing, like it was just been like, you know, make it happen. Yeah, exactly. Like succeed. Period. <laughs> yeah with the or and then yeah so anyway and then early on like from what i understand um you know some of us actually did quite well back then from what i from what i understand compared to what people are paid now i think we actually made more money um for sure not that it's all and it's not all about money but you want to make a living but i you know i was i was told at one point that i was the highest paid smith app ath athlete like ever other than like who was it? I don't know. Someone who's much more important than me. Are you willing to share? I I was making like over thirty grand from from I for eyewear for a couple of years with Smith, and then I switched to Zeal and had a good contract with them. But do um, you know what the contracts were looking like at the same time in snowboarding? No. I just know it's spread thin now, and I don't know how. I mean, everything's changed so much. We didn't have to promote our selves except with our sponsors and then they were in charge of promoting us that's why i've never been like i haven't really gone back on social media and i'm not really i don't really I, for one thing i just i really enjoy just doing my own thing but um <clears throat> i can't fully relate to the influencer thing <laughs> and i i keep people i get gear from people and they're like hey we tag us and i just haven't really been able to adapt <laughs> 
I mean, yeah. that's one way to call it. You also have some other things going on that you're putting yeah. <laughs> energy into. And at some point, especially once you become a parent and if you have to make a living, there's really only so much time. Yeah. And my ski spots are all secret now. And I'm like, no cameras. <laughs> <laughs> what a shift. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, you, you brought something up and someone asked a question. Um, I think there's this, I mean, I can say, you know, from my experience, most people who get to go heli skiing, especially for a film company, to a point they're supported by sponsors, but to a, a bigger point in long term, they probably were supported by family uh, or uh, a trust. Did you you know, how did you pay for your heli skiing? Like, when did you get cut off or like, how did that work? Um, we had budgets. We had good, I had like, I had, well, I mean, once again, like going back to developing how things worked in the industry, like I went, I, I don't know who I, th you know, I feel like I was probably one of the first people that did this. Um, but I would be like, this is my salary and this is my travel budget. This money goes to me and this money goes to me to promote me. So like, with Smith, for example, I'd be like, okay, look, I'm get the $30,000 is my salary and I need fit. I need like 10 or whatever it is for a heli budget. By the way, heli scheme, when I was doing it was way less expensive. We need to talk that. about that because <clears throat> now you can't go up there without like 25 K minimum, you know, and then paying the filmers. That. Yeah. No, we would go, we, we were like, I mean, we had it so much better. I think I can't, I can't remember the rates, but I, I know we we're just paying like probably like a quarter to a fifth of what they pay now. So it was just way more. It was still seemed to like a lot back then. But, um, you know, we would go, especially when I started doing TGR, we'd let, we would just go straight to the heli company, get our own heli, bring our own guide. We'd bring Conway, who still works with TGR. But we'd, take, we'd bring Conway and be like, look, we've got our own guide. We just want the helicopter. So we just go direct, right? So we weren't going through an operator. And at times we were going through operators. But um, and at, at those times too, like the operators, somebody just you know, wrote fifty dollars a run. Is that right? What? Someone just wrote fifty dollars. Well, a run. no, that, that was originally that was with Chet. That was the original Alaska heli scheme. You'd buy a chip for fifty bucks and get a bump to one of the peaks outside of the Santa Valley, like Diamond being probably as far as you'd go. But yeah, that was like a fifty dollar bump. Though I have a good story. I have a good Alaska story. I was hanging out at the. <laughs> I was hanging out at the base of ABA when Chet was flying and like, there's so many old Chet stories, but he used to have like his gun and he'd shoot it once in a while. But I remember this group of guys from Aspen were like, but wait, just so everybody, if you don't know who Chet is from the industry, he was one of the original helicopter pilots came from uh, the, the vet Vietnam or something. Yeah. It was like a Vietnam vet, which a bunch of the good pilots were, were a lot of our best pilots were always military guys, but and Alaska was like untamed. There were no rules. You could just pay this guy to drop you off somewhere. No safety. No no guide. No names of it. Peaks. <laughs> yeah, we name. I mean, we. I. I. Yeah, I mean, we named things that we did like first ascents that you can see from the road, like back then, you know, because like you named them the books or whatever. Yeah, like I didn't. Like Doug had already done, like named the prom. I, I want to get to Doug too. Yeah, or early people. You know, Doug, you have like Jerry Hans, Doug, um, you know, the rap, the rap films guys were up there really early. Like Trevor and Eric Peterson went. What happened to them? Your and like, uh, what's the other one? Pipe, pipe, pontoon, you know, because they rode on the pontoons and they named the pontoons massive. And it's pretty deep. Like those guys went deep early um, <clears throat> and they were flying with Chet. And so, but anyway, so. Yeah, these guys from Aspen were like, hey, will you guide us? Um, will you guide us on Diamond? And I'd never skied Diamond, but I'd seen like footage of it. And I was like, yeah, I'll guide you down Diamond. <laughs> will you buy me a heli chip? You know, we weren't filming back then. We were just hanging out heli chip and in high we used to hike. We'd like you get you could take a plane ride up to the base of um what some of the close things and then get out and walk up. So that first couple of years we were just walking around and just skiing whatever we could without filming but um yeah so i guided these guys down diamond uh, and it was like powder and it was i'd never guided i didn't really know and i didn't know what i know now about snow safety and the rest of it but it was pretty it was very loose it sounds so cool though and so like accessible a heli chip that sounds like taking a run up the gondola 
And it sounds like that's what you did. Not yeah, they were poker chips. Yeah, the only way we could get out there, any any way I could get out there now is like because someone's filming something and paying a lot, um, like not a chance can you go just for fun unless you have financial support from family or whatnot. Yeah, I haven't heli skied for a while. <laughs> Reg, I saw Reggie, you know, two days ago. And he's like, dude, you need to come up to Haynes. And I'm like, bro, when I see Yeah, he him, says that to everybody. <laughs> so I can afford it, I'll come back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, okay, so anyway, so it was it was much cheaper for us, and then like, yeah, it was my that's kind of the bottom line. And the, but then going back to your question, I had budgets from my sponsors that were allocated towards travel, and then sometimes I when I'd hit that, and I'd and I'd provide them with all the receipts. I'd come back and be like, "Here's all the receipts," and um, and then they'd pay me. Um, but they and they were getting the film footage somehow. They would get. It was, it was usually like they just pay, like I got to a point where I was really reliable. Like I was getting shit done. You delivered. So they would be like, you know, early on I'd be like, I had photo incentive. It used to be called photo incentive. You got a picture in a magazine and you, sh and it showed the logo. Like you'll see some of the early photos of us. We had like logos and shit on our hats, like more, way more visible than people do now. Cause like, if you got the brand name and the photo, then you got paid whatever it was for the photo. So that was that happened for a while. Um, and then I would just went straight to where I was like, Hey, I just want the budget. <laughs> and then they could use us for their ads and they'd have to usually pay something extra to the photographer to, to buy a photo. Um, yeah. And so did it get to a point you said you got really burnt out? Like, I mean, I, I know you were filming with multiple with, you were like one of the only guys that, that was allowed to film with both, um, you know, hmm. film crews, you know, being matchstick and TGR and you're putting heavy segments down, sometimes down in like in a day from what I heard, you like the <clears throat> airs you would take. So I can see how doing all that for so long would burn you out. Um, yeah. Talk about what, what it really um, looked like behind the scenes from what everybody saw every year that burned Well, out. I did matchstick and TGR segments probably like three years and then like maybe throw Warren Miller into that too. Some other time, like one, at least one other time. I did what, I have this really embarrassing Warren Miller segment from like before, it was like the, it was really early and it's me and Jim Conway. Jim Conway, who's the TGR guide was an athlete. And he was, Jim was like such a like douchey guide kind of person back then and then he switched into like being cool but i was in europe with jim conway doing this warren miller shoot i can't even remember the movie but it's pretty embarrassing it's not, not quite as embarrassing as shane and i on snowblades or ski feet or whatever those things were called in las lanias when we were forced to do that by next to pay for the trip but um wait, wait wait what's that story like if you watch the early it's called alpine rapture and it's the first film that shane and are that, that both Shane and I did with Nick Nixon. And we went to Las Lanias. I've always been more like, screw that. I'm not doing that. Like, I've always been more like, that's not going to work for me. <laughs> but anyway, so we go there and, and so Nick had had like these, um, they're like boots that have skis. Like there's someone brought them back, something like that recently. But <clears throat> He's like, hey, we got to shoot this segment with these things because they're paying for the trip. <laughs> and um, and so like I was like, no way, no way. And Shane's like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I do not want that on my I don't want that on my resume. But anyway, so I ended up having to go out and do this thing with those guys, with, with Shane and I doing these <laughs> stupid boot skis. And like Shane actually thought they were kind of cool. I'm I was sure like, he did. Are, I was like, these are not cool at all like he's like saucer boy loves these yeah well that was pre-saucer boy i know but um, we know he was always in there <laughs> yeah but um yeah so so what'd you guys do we just like you can only use them on groomers we just have this you can find it somewhere i don't know <laughs> probably hopefully it's it's on it you know if you can ever get a hold of those old movies but we're just like skiing like you together. guys do. Like literally like together. I mean, it's so ridiculous. And then we're wearing like the most ugly, like 
flashy early spider clothes that if you see some of my early footage i'd be we were like really this is what we're wearing like <laughs> um so anyway yeah so we changed all that stuff like we get the clothes sucked back then and finally like we were wearing i went through a year when i was sponsored by sessions i was getting clothes from um uh oh god this other snowboard company like I was getting, and I was like, I'm just wearing snowboard clothes because no one in the ski industry will make anything that I'll wear. Um, and then, like after that year, I got then Billy Jacobs from Spider brought me on, and he's like, "Hey, you can design your own clothes, and we're just going to do a clothing line and name it after you." And then it became, uh, well, first I was sponsored by Strike, which was Spider's snowboard line, and then that switched into Kreitler, and then. That switched into Venom, which was. Did you hear that, guys? Kreitler, the ski line. I don't have I... any of those clothes. I should have kept some. I had like, I always had like little flair, you know. I had like silver. You know, on the, the little on flair. <laughs> you know, like the kids don't have any flair anymore. I'm like, dude, put some fucking color on. Like you, you guys all, all, all had to have flair. Give me a break. Jamie Moore. Um, that's like why Seth had to have purple hair and Shane well, we were had all... to like do everything naked. You guys had to have like. Some, yeah, well, we grew up with like we were we were like Sex Pistols, like we were you know we had the I mean everyone I mean I don't know how it is now the mu I people are we were pretty influenced by the music we grew up around you know and we were it went well pretty, with skiing <laughs> yeah so we were pretty flashy and then you know you had Brad Holmes and angry seemed like everybody was yeah angry. you were pretty angry because we were pretty angry at the industry we were pretty like. We had like a chip on our shoulder. You were rebels. Sure. Cause at that we time were. you were we coming were total up. Total rebels because we were totally uncool by snowboarders and the ski industry wouldn't accept us. We were so far out and left in like the left corner, like no one would listen to us. And we were just like, I'm trying to keep my, I'm trying not to swear, but we were kind of just like, fuck you to everyone and just did our own thing. We were, and like, and it's not only us, there were like a lot of people who were less, who were, there were a lot of people who didn't have the notoriety that we did, who we were very close with, like um, Shane Chanley from Mammoth and Griffin, uh, Griffin and uh, what up, Griffin? What's the other guy's name? The two guys, these are these two guys from Mount Hood area. Some of you guys all heard of these guys, but they made the first twin tips. They like made these tips that you could like bolt onto your back of your skis. So we go up to hood and like the whole posse though back then was always just like five to ten people like there was just and then there would be like 400 snowboarders and then like a whole bunch of racers with their spider like fancy flashy gear on in their race suits and us you know mm, love yeah. it these stories are amazing yeah oh, but we still have to get to the like the burnout oh the burnout uh, I did it for 15 years and like I was I was doing like very dangerous things most of the time and, and you were always feeling like you had to up it from the year before uh, yeah there's the, there's that factor like you always kind of have to well back then yeah you always had to up your game and things were progressing so fast that you kind of had to keep up well I was always trying to keep up on the freestyle end to some degree like I was a you know by the time I retired or whatever at some point i was doing 720s off of cliffs and back flips and front flips and you were uh, like the first one what i mean <laughs> they say you invented the cork 360. so oh, well that was from squat that was more of a park thing but i was on downhill skis in the strike snowboard clothing like in 1990. doing a cork 360. i was doing cork sevens on 217 downhill skis yeah <clears throat> you had to really throw them around <laughs> It was a lot of, there's a lot of swing weight, but, um, so that's yeah, why that, you worked out all the time. Yeah, no one would do, I was <laughs> shooting all this stuff in the park. This was like in the park at Squaw, but back then, like the snowboard industry was even like putting a lot of park shots in magazines, but powder, no one would publish it. They were like grabbing. I was grabbing for a couple of years before anyone would touch it. And like the only reason I have posters out of grabbing skis in Obermeyer, which was my first sponsor. It's one of the most infamous, like. Like with my headband yeah. and my hair coming out the top. I might use because that. Because I made the them use business. it. And like, I made the music because I wanted things recorded historically. Because I knew like. How did you make them use it? 
I was like, let's use this shot. I was like, trust me, use this. And some sponsors would never listen. They were like, no, we're going to use this. We're just going to do is what we want for our market, which sometimes would be a turn. Oh, yeah. Whatever. I but know all about that. With Obermeyer, I was like, let's make a post. I want to make like I want to use this. And they did it. And there were Klaus Obermeyer is fucking epic, by the way. Anyway, he's such a legend. I mean, he's I heard he skied one day this year. I think he's 100. But <clears throat> such a cool family brand. Um. But um, yeah, like with the seven with the corks, I knew that no one else was doing corks with grabs. Like I knew it, and I took Hank debris up, and I was like, Hank, I need to shoot this because like, whatever. I just wanted to, to, you know, you're always trying to document your shit when you come. Well, up. it sounds too like you were vocal. You were vocal about what you wanted, you wanted to do, what your plans were, what you were going to deliver. Yeah, I was a little bit. Uh, I was quite confident and outspoken <laughs> where do you think you got that um i was really shy as a kid and like i kind of was i was pretty shy i mean i was good at sports but i was always pretty reserved and then um when i was in college i was kind of the same way and then when i like won that event in 93 oops hold on did i just cut you off we'll see oh wait there you are yeah there Sorry, you i had messages coming up on my phone i was just trying to get them off um 93. I finally was like, well, I can kind of do whatever I want. And then like with the ski industry, we had to kind of, you can either like, if there's things that are going against you, you can either kind of retreat or you can just like put yourself out there and try to take charge. And so I felt like my attitude was more like, I'm just going to put myself out there and like make it happen. Cause it has to be done. I don't know. I just got more that way. And I was always really fun. To, I was I was a pretty fun person. But yeah, I was also like, fun. I'm known to be kind of serious. Um, but that's because I also have like a competitive edge. And I was I trained. The other reason I can tell like people out there who are pro skiers, I, I wasn't just like, I, I was in the gym like every day. I would go ski. I'd go to the gym. I'd like take a nap. And then I'd go home. I mean, I'd go home and take a nap. And then I'd, um, <laughs> and then I'd usually go out at night. I was usually like out until late. Like we used to go out every night. We were kind of ragers, but I and trained. So this is like what ages? Um, up until like through my twenties, pretty much. And then. And where'd you get that discipline? Like, how'd you know? Growing up here in Sun Valley. Like on the, the race team? Yeah. I just feel like I was really influenced by like a local athletic culture here. And, um, yeah, and being on ski team, like being through it, being in a disciplined race program was was good. And then is that where you first started training? Is the discipline? I know. I don't know. Training? For some reason, I just got into like being in the gym and stuff when I was a kid. And then, um, you know, like, yeah, and it just, I noticed, yeah, I mean, it's important for them to be, I mean, to stay healthy, like you kind of have to be an athlete. I don't think you can you're not going to have a 15 career, like 15 year. I skied, I was 38, you know, and I'm, I still feel pretty damn good. I don't train like I used to, but, um, you know, if you're going to have a long career, you better be, you're not just going to be able to just go ride rails and, you know, do whatever all day skiing. You need to do other things. Well, it's interesting Tra because I feel like none of that was part of, the story of the culture, you know, that you grew up in, it, it seemed like it was all partying and traveling and uh, partying and sending it, you know, like nobody yeah. talked about training. And I feel like from what I know, I know understanding, that. it seemed like you might've been the only one who took it as seriously because it was supposed to be just this joke. And, and that's just my. Yeah. I don't know. I think I was, I think that's why I lasted so long. Well, I think also that's why people started to take it seriously is because you put the time in. We're one of the people that put the time in to send the emails and the letters at that time, because was there even, and then letters, yeah. And show With up at the emails. trade shows. Right. And make phone calls. And, uh, and I can tell you took it seriously as opposed to this pressure we're supposed to have on it where it's like, it's just for fun. It's just a joke. So you can't, like, don't try that hard. Uh, Who I, says I, that? It's there. It's a perception. It's more, you know, and uh, yeah, 
Um, no, it's so probably right. No, it's, and that you should just that's, be a able to show that's a perception up. of people who generally don't succeed for very long. But that's still like this. Um, I don't know. There's a. It's not yeah. known that the people who I guarantee I'm not the only one. Obviously, no, you're not. How it's just not a story that's that's told. It's no, maybe, it's kind of blanketed, like in like action sports, or just for people who just want to chill and like be good. Drink at their energy drink, and then you send. That's all you no, gotta do. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I don't think it does for anyone. I know the surfer. I know pro surfers train super hard, from what I from what I hear from videos. I've we watched. hear that now, but like but we again, also send it super hard party. <laughs> I mean, we yeah. I think a lot of people do though, but it's definitely part of the culture, and it's really fun. I mean, you're with all these super fun people, but every time I was in any town, I would be like, when I was traveling on ski trips, I'd be like, "Where's the gym?" You know, because on down days, especially Alaska, I feel like in the valley to use gym, you know, it's like what, you can't just sit around for a week doing nothing and then get off the couch and throw down. Yeah. <clears throat> and I guess, do you, this isn't the best, I know we're jumping around here a lot. Sorry, friends, uh, bear with me. We'll come around. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, do you think that also led to you losing a lot of friends at that time because of this intensity and maybe a lot of partying, a lot of sending without kind of that other side of strength training and focus and you know what do you mean like my, being my, more mindful with people or i have no idea i'm just i'm just trying to figure out um you know you are one of the few that's still here you know is there something to that still here and well and some of these pioneering stories you know that we've all been told and that are, are our friends well, I, there's a lot of people i have stories about who are i mean there's a lot of people who don't get recognition that they could get but you, you know like Aaron that. McGovern was like we're really yeah. close he's an amazing skier and he was always really like fun to be around and great and then like Dave Swanwick is a guy who won the worlds once at least and um that I really enjoy being on trips with he's pretty dry but or he was pretty dry then in certain ways I mean he's pretty fun we were just hanging out a couple of weeks ago but you know like he was super supportive and like a really good person to feel safe with in the bit in the mountains there's a lot What's of people he doing who, now he's jumped around a lot oh god he has like a gummy tea he he was part of like that production company with comey and jaquit uh and then COVID hit and then they ended up starting this like they're like a supplier for for t for for thc gummies <laughs> for for bigger companies and then they're apparently they're doing like a psilocybin gummy now or something but anyway he's involved go in swanee swanee yeah he's, swanee. I mean, he's yeah. doing well swanee um but i mean there's so many people that are yeah i mean go there. for it because but i i did go a little long i i also was like one of the only guys who like did both big mountain and got in the park right you had like me seth was doing big tricks like super sick flips um so like, uh, and Shane, Shane was actually not as active skiing for quite a few years. I, he was part of the reason he was doing so much base jumping is his, he didn't do the gym time and things. His, not to say that whether or not for sure that would have helped him, but he had like massive knee problems, had blown his hip out twice, like his, and his back, I mean, his body was like a mess. So he kind of segued into the, you know, base jump segments and, um, you know, you don't really see park segments of Shane much. Um, but, um, but obviously Shane was known for doing some pretty amazing tricks. <laughs> um, mostly flips like Shane was like a flipper, but I was like a grabber corker, you know, kind of person. And so like you have like us three, like me, Shane and Seth, who really kind of like grew bigger out of my generation. And it was probably because we not only did Big Mountain, but we also did tricks. And, had, and, and don't, and do you think it's because, you know, you guys went with the film crews, these, these film crews that, you know, continue to make films. Yeah. Or I mean, were all those guys doing the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I blew it later in my career. I should have been doing TGR movies still, but I was trying out other projects. And like one of the last projects I did was with Rage Films. And we went to Alaska and we crushed it. And then like they cut all the big mountain footage out of their movie. And it was like a jib movie. Um, 
and I did that with, I was up there with Reggie and Zach and some other people, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's good to be in the big films and like even Carl Fosvet, you know, like I've told him, he's got his Brapski thing going and it's really cool. I love going to the premieres and everything, but, uh, and I think he's probably doing okay. And with social media, it's just different now. So I'm not going to pretend that I understand the industry, but even with him, I was like, dude, get involved in the bigger product. And he did an MSP film that year, not just because I told him, I'm sure, but other things, but I was like, you know, you want to be in the big films. Like, it's cool that you're doing your own projects and you have your social media, but get an MSP or TGR. Cause like, we all have that rebellious spirit and you're like, Oh, I'm going to be part of this cool fringe project. But then like those projects, you know, they just don't go any as far, but I've seen some that are amazing. Those guys out of Canada who did uh, like, there's some really cool films coming out of smaller projects. No doubt. It's just hard to get visibility on them because there's so many now. Yeah. It's hard to get the visibility and like, it's hard to get your foot in the door with, you know, and it comes down to sponsors too. Like I was only in one Warren Miller film that was like a legit segment that Micah Black and I did. And it was because I was a Rosignol athlete for three years. Otherwise I just didn't, I had totally, I just had sponsorship complex and I couldn't be in those movies. So it's like, you got to have all those pieces fit together. And it's like, you almost want to go after North Face just so you can be in a Warren or a TGR movie or, you know, or atomic or whatever it is, or, you know, you got to be aligned with those sponsors or you're kind of not going to get in there. Even now you, you I would, I would assume so. I don't know for sure, but yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Mostly <clears throat> because those brands, you know, have the backing to actually send you on trips and help you, you know, uh, yeah. Capture pay for cinematographers and, uh, I know. And I, I like the smaller brands so much. Like I like, like I like, I like helping startups and now I can do whatever I want. It's fun. I get gear from people, but just to get some gear, but you You're know, just like model now, what I just, I just, I'm just a bad ambassador. Basically. I just don't like, they're like, what? anyway. Cause you're, they're like, you have I to tag us and I you're should, like, I don't yeah, know. I'm so bad at it and I don't do anything, but I'd like to actually settle in somewhere for a little bit more. I'd actually like to do a segment again. And if my company in Panama starts doing well, I'm going to self-sponsor myself to be on a TGR movie again. Um, How I'm much like, will that cost? Cause I want to, I'm turning 53 on Monday. I'm like, I want to have, I don't know, but I'm like, I want to have, I'm like, I'm, I, Maybe it's in my head and I'm overconfident, but I'm pretty sure I can throw down still. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can. You know, that's something. And one of the reasons that I had, we had to talk because I, I watch these old ski movies and I watch new ski movies and I just haven't seen people get that much better than you guys. <laughs> like the way you skied is really hard has been really hard to follow, I guess. I just, I think we all assume like it's always going to progress and just get bigger and bigger and absolutely tricks have for sure. But in terms of skiing, like <laughs> I don't watch like that turning, many ski like movies. turning part? The turning or like getting down something like in a powerful, graceful like yeah. way. It, I, I don't, you don't see that, that like that's not what the ski movies are. And so I don't really watch oh, it. I see, I don't. I see things that are pretty impressive. Um, and, and, and you're, so do I for sure all day long. And you guys are pretty good skiers. I don't think the line skiing part of it has uh, evolved, but I think the tricks and lines part of it has That's what I'm, got very impressive. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 We were, we were like, part of the reason I quit too is like Doug had died and like other people had gotten really injured and I'd had had a major injury. Like we were almost like so early that we were like, just like kind of dumb. Like we were, we ski, like if you look at some of the early lines and you had gotten away with a lot, we people got away yeah. with things and I didn't, didn't have repercussions at times. You know, you look at some of like McGovern's <laughs> things that he did or anyone and like <clears throat> and um you know you start to realize after doug passed away and i was and I, I regarded him as someone who was quite careful 
Um, and I regarded myself as kind of loose, but careful at the same time. But, um, you know, it's like you start to know about people who died skiing, who are your peers. And so, you know, it's different before that. Cause you're like, Oh no, well, no one really gets hurt. We can just charge harder and harder. Um, but I mean, there's definitely an art to like slough management and a lot of things. Like I've seen people from this year get taken out by their slough in Haynes. And I'm like, don't, you guys, I guess like they just haven't learned yet. I mean, we had so much experience. I was in, I've spent over a year of my life in Alaska and it was just like, that's the other thing is like age is on your side for big mountain and like getting into those heavier situations. Like you learn so much every year and you get more comfortable. Like um, the really hot shot young skiers aren't going to ever like it takes, you know, they need like three years of going up there. I think before they can, like really get on the ball. Like I think Carl Fosfett's on like his fourth year or so up there. Like I think he's probably crushing it now, you know. But yeah, but he was crushing it his first year too. And I think there's something so beautiful to yeah, those awesome. athletes that haven't been hurt before and they are in that place or being in that place where you you've done you've succeeded at everything so far and you're gonna do the same here. Like seeing that kind of skiing and knowing remembering that in myself was good times too. <laughs> But seeing some of those youngsters, like you said, get away with a lot because they're fresh and new. And all. yeah, I know. I mean, obviously, really, I don't follow people, but I, I because I look at things, I, I guess like Instagram just feeds me like there's like some, uh, I don't know, other people collect like marquee shots off of people. I don't follow people because I don't want to see like so much material on them. I just want to see the highlights. Um, but I, you know, stuff comes by on my feed that I'm very impressed by pretty often. Yeah. Yeah. But you had said yourself, like the lines haven't uh, progressed. No, there's no reason why they should. I mean, we pushed it. I mean, there's only so far you can go, you know, skiing above a cliff, exposure, slough happening everywhere. I mean, we did that. So it's, I don't know if there's more you can do to than what's already happening and just do you think that's why in some ways um the the pie that you guys created is shrinking well there's more mouths to feed and i don't know the how i don't know what the numbers are in the industry and the industry has always been kind of cheap on free skiing i don't know what the budgets are for racing but i feel like they've just consistently I mean, I don't know. I don't know how marketing, I mean, it's basically, it comes down to marketing dollars, right? That's what you are. You're a marketing tool as good as you think you are and everything else and how much people appreciate you. You're a marketing tool. So like, what's the marketing budget and how much is going toward how much value are you bringing to selling product and keeping brand names out there? And what's cool at the time to be promoted versus, you know, if you fit what the, what the thing is that is mm, cool at the moment. Yeah. I don't know what's cool at this moment. I, I don't, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I mean, it's weird. Like you have like, like I watched the Olympics or I didn't even watch the X games this year, but I mean the people, the things people are doing in big airs are mind blowing. But I think like, I don't even know. I think like there's so many athletes and there's like such high talent. And I think some of these people aren't even really getting paid. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's, I know there's a lot it's more. Like you got to get into your niche, you know, and that's one thing that I was good at. And even back then, like I got into my niche, I was Kent Kreitler. I brand, you got to self brand. That's when, that's why like when all these kids look the same and they're all wearing like, I, I just don't, like, I don't, it seems like there's not, I mean, not like you have to go out and like try to be different because you should be yourself, but I feel like, you know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that much about people's personalities. And I guess that would help if I followed them. Well, I think you're bringing up um, some interesting points that not many people think about now. But for people that ever wanted to follow this path, you're talking about branding yourself, right? And you somehow knew about that as you were coming up in your 20s. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. Just be yourself. 
and put it out there. Don't be, be yourself, though. Don't be just like, I'm part of this group. Like, no one wants to buy the group. Or a copy of somebody group. else. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> um, I want to bring up, like, some names. And I just want you to, like, <clears throat> you know, share from your perspective. Because there's na there are names that we we know of, uh, but you grew up with these people. So, uh, Peekaboo Street. What? Just... Fighting what? with Peekaboo in the ski team band. <laughs> the first thing that comes to my head. <laughs> Fighting with Peekaboo in the ski team band? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Were you guys the same age? Is she older, younger? Same age. Yeah. It, explain. Oh, I Why don't know. I just remember in the back. Well, it seems like all the parents go to all the events now. Back when I was a kid, they, we, they used to stuff us all in the van, and the parents were like, Woo, the kids are gone. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just remember being in these van rides, you know, to Salt Lake or whatever from up here in, in Jackson. That was the Intermountain Division. But um, Peekaboo, yeah, I just remember her like ski from then. I don't have a lot of Peekaboo memories. The, my, my best one is a couple years ago. We hung out and had coffee at Starbucks. But what were you fighting about in the van? Oh, God, just, you know, we used to play poker and cheat on each, like everyone would be cheating. And it's just like, what happens when you put, you know, 12 kids into a van together? That like are super hours. competitive. <laughs> <laughs> High achievers. <laughs> yeah. um, here's another name, Doug Coombs. Mm, just respect. Um, he was really fun. Well, Doug, my so my best Doug story is like, and I've told this several times, but um, well, Doug was at the early events. Well, there's okay. Here's a different Doug story at the Las Lanius event, which was the first one. The first uh, for people listening, the first South American Extreme 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 Extreme. championships. And Doug was the head judge. And they, I was, we were up, they started the, the run up on top of Cerro Hoya or whatever it is the peak that's in the back. And like the peak is just like this rock wall. That's like this 40 foot cliff or something. I don't know. It's, fairly large but that was the starting gate and so like someone went someone else went the big like story that came out of the event was there were a couple guys who were rappelling in the event and shane and i just like jumped the the same lines that these guys were rappelling into this is really early on when there was sort of i saw that footage it was legit there was like this mountaineering thing going on but <laughs> I was on top of the peak and they fucking iced me there because I was I was like, I'm just they were like, where are you going? And I was like, I'm going straight off. <laughs> and they were like, whoa, 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 hold. And the judges like put it all on hold. And they were like, don't let him go. And then they had to talk it over. And then Coombs is like, they Coombs is finally like, just let him go. Just let him go. And so that was like one of my Doug, Doug stories. Otherwise, one time I ski with Doug and Jackson and Doug was ducking all the ropes with me. We like ducked the rope into Corbett's, ducked the rope into like no name or whatever that thing's called. And I was like, is it okay that we're just ducking the ropes? And he's like, he's like, yeah, it's, you're fine. You're with me. Like, kind of like I can do whatever I want. And then he, that was the year that later in the year, they, they, kicked they off. booted him off the resort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They had to make an example of him, didn't they? Like, do you know anything more about that story? Well, I think he was just disrespecting the ski patrol and they finally had to call him on it. Well then, but he said, you're with me. So that must've meant something. What, what, what well, he felt like to? he was immune, which we tend to do. I don't feel like I'm totally immune, but I also tend to break the rules a little bit. Cause I know, I know what, like. So what it I'm wasn't doing. because they were like allowing him because he was him. It was just cause he was that good in his mind. You're with me, nothing bad. Happened. Well, he knows everyone. You know, he like knew everyone on patrol and he just felt like they would never really bust him, I think, you know, and um, he, would, he, but he had like, fun, he always had a fun spirit about it. He didn't have like a big attitude. He was kind of like, we're good. Plus, like yeah. you get to where you're like, <clears throat> I mean, you, if you do enough big mountain or whatever for long enough, you get to where you, you kind of know more than, and have more, you have more knowledge and skill and background than pretty much everyone on ski patrol so you know you get to something that's close not anymore now this is pretty good <laughs> well i don't know jackson but if you and i you know now patrollers are all amazing they'll know they're but we we did have like i mean i have like more big mountain experience than you know so many 
just from so many different adventures. And like the other thing about filming is like, we're always going out on the most dangerous day. Like we're going out as soon as it turns blue after the storm and we're getting straight into the most dangerous shit, the most dangerous. shit. <laughs> and then we're making assessments. And so we're doing like really high level Abbey work all the time. So that it gets hard to come back and have something closed on your sea mountain. And you're like, eh, like, you know, you know, the whole history of the snowpack and everything else. And you're like, this doesn't really need to be closed, you know? So, you know, I'm sure that probably happened with Doug <laughs> in that, in that scenario where he just feels like, or he did know he did. That's why I'm like, they must have had to do something. They had to make an example or something. Like, I just want to know the backstory of what really went down there. I think they do. They have to make examples because they, they can't just let you go all the time. And then two Squaw years later. Squaw was actually pretty cool about it. Squaw has a, Squaw, I don't know how it is now, but they had this more like this attitude where they'd, they'd fence things. They'd fence stuff off, but it was more like a public closure. And they knew, I mean, they knew that we knew what we were doing. And so they, there would be like a gap behind the fence and it would keep like, it would keep everyone else out of there, but they'd kind of be like, okay, well, this will keep the Do people. Do they still do that? I don't know. Squad? Probably not. <laughs> oh yeah. Neither of us are in your squad anymore. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Yeah. I'm just taking all that in. Um, I mean, you gain so much experience and I hear, I mean, like we were, self-guiding really i mean we someplace i mean everywhere you go you want to have a guide because they know the history that's the most important thing if you you need someone who knows the history of the snowpack but once you get familiar with that then you're on your own and like we would spend so much time in alaska that we were just doing all of our own snow assessments and we had conway with us um teaching us who was amazing and you know being doing it when i did we always had the like kind of the best guide everywhere we went because that was who would get stuck with us. Um, and so I always learned from the, like, I've had, I took, I've taken Abby one, but I feel like I know as much about Abby control as anyone anywhere. You don't really need the courses are great, but you don't really gain. You really gain from experience. Well, and when you put in as much time in the biggest mountains being Alaska and mm -hmm. having to take full responsibility for your own safety, that does expand your horizons to the point where, yeah, you're, you know what you're doing. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so. As opposed to, you know, most of the public at a, at a mountain. Um, I mean, so getting back to uh, just uh, the transition, this is obviously going to be a multi-part uh, <laughs> interview, um, but the transition and why you got burnt out and then what was the big, the big injury? Uh, well, those weren't, related um, i know these are just i, I did it for fi i was 15 years into it and um and then it was like i got to this point where like take i think like spider for example it was time to renew my contract which i generally had pushed to be like three years by that point in my career i was like i wouldn't sign anything for less than three years because i just the renegotiation process is a pain and i um but i had like that i think it, you know, whatever I had that coming up and they were, they were going to lower my salary from like 60 grand to 30 or something. And I was like, I'm, I felt like, I felt like I could do less than I'd been doing and still have, I felt like I still had the, uh, the, the marketability based on all my history, which I think is more, I think, I think that's honored more now, you know, Back then it was like this whole new wave was coming in and it was like another battle that I was going to have to fight of like, Hey, I can chill a little more and do less and still have all the value that I have. But they were talking about bringing my contracts down. And once again, like when you consider, I've never looked at the books for a ski company, but when you consider like what goes into racing, like one racer and the amount of pairs of skis and a tuner. I mean, I'm not talking about Michaela Schifrin or someone who's exceptional, but just like in general, like I just felt, I just still felt like I was just tired of fighting people over how be, how cheap they were being. Um, and I also had achieved all my goals and um, I just felt like, 
I needed to start. I felt like I needed for one thing to start making some better money. If I wanted to live in a ski town and like have a family, I mean, I wasn't really thinking about a family so much at that time, but <clears throat> I was just kind of thinking if I'm going to basically well, for me, I actually grew up in a family that, that had like quite a bit of money. And I was like, if I'm ever going to live the way that I once lived <laughs> until I was 18, like this isn't going to do it. So I started just kind of adding that up and had I been smarter, you know, whatever, I would have retired from skiing and gone straight into finance. <clears throat> um, and at the same time, um, I just was tired of like being on trips all the time at that time. I mean, if I could have taken like two years off and gone back, like that might've worked, but just always being traveling and always being in snow and always being in this intense situation. And then just a, <clears throat> a lot of the, uh, and it was, yeah, I don't know, just, you know, you get as an athlete, you're a lot of times you're on trips that with people who you, you don't have that much in common with, except you both love skiing. There's a lot of like other differences. And so you're kind of forced into situations with people who might not have the, like a lot of other things in common with you who aren't your closest friends. Um, <clears throat> and other times- it was also competitive or was it not competitive? And it's still competitive. Yeah, you had to be, you have to be competitive just to stay in the game, you know, mm -hmm. like, even if it's even if you're not competing, you still have to be competitive. And I think I just got, I think I was just I did some self analysis on like where my head was at where my head was and where my ego was. And I was just like, okay, this like, this scenario isn't really maturing me, like a kind of being in ski towns, being in the ski industry, being an athlete. And like, you know, you're kind of a, like a rock star who's not able to live like a rock star. And, um, and then, yeah, I just saw where my competitive side of me was and it just didn't feel healthy anymore. Wow. Like I had to just get out of it because for me, like to stay in it, I, well, I, you know, well, let me think about this. I have to go back in time. Yeah, I mean, you just have to be competitive. And as we all kind of like deny how competitive we are, Shane McConkie was competitive as hell. He was all he wanted everything was a competition. You'd sit down at dinner and he'd be like, hey, let's see who can like flick a booger the furthest off the table. I mean, <laughs> but um, That's gotta be like, everything was a competition with him, man. And like, we're all competitive and you kind of try to deny how competitive you are with people. And like, it's nice to appreciate what other people are doing too. And I think a lot of the kids are better at that now. Like we didn't grow up with, at that time we had to be so competitive to be, to be acknowledged um, anyway. Um, so yeah, you have to be competitive, man. That's what makes a good athlete in any sport. And I just got to where Tired. I didn't want to throw down that hard anymore and be you know healing my body all the time i mean i was always like seeing this getting rolfed and seeing i had like a regular massage therapist and i was always and i got tired of training all the time too it's yeah it's super intense to keep up that level of performance yeah and a lot of people don't know well i mean i think i think they do um but yeah and so how was it was it brutal the transition Good. I mean, I kind of just cut off completely mm -hmm. and I moved, I wanted to be out of ski. I just thought I needed to just do a total reset and be anonymous and not be important in any way. I moved to this, I moved to San Fran. No one knew me. I had to make friends based on my character, not on, I really enjoy going in any ski town now, actually, to be that honest. Must have been really like, hard. Cause you know, I enjoy the love. I enjoy the love and the camaraderie. But at that time I was like, I just need to disconnect because like everyone knows me for like this and um, and it was good for me. But it was like, it was just, it was kind of a, it was a strange, looking back, it was a, a strange time in my life. But I think it's important to go through those periods and take yourself out of your comfort zone. I don't know, for me it was. There's just, it felt like something I needed to do. Yeah, good for you. I think. Uh, and did you know where you were going to go? I mean, I or wasn't. Did you just know you had to start. You had to start fresh. Or did you have an idea like, well, I'm going to go in this direction? Uh, no. I wish I would have had. I was doing like random work things, trying things. Did yoga teacher training. Did life coach training. I was always kind of drawn more in that like 
healer realm. I always, I always had this kind of, I still do have this spiritual thing going on um, where I'm, you know, I think it's important. I think we all have questions on like, why are we here and what, how does consciousness work and how are we, how do we fit into the universe and what the hell is the universe? And so, you know, those are like the big questions, right? If you don't ask those, then I don't know. I think it's, those are important questions, but um, that lead us all into our spirituality or how are things really functioning? Um, so I like kind of got into this like help area and I enjoyed yoga and I enjoyed people from that community. But then I was like, okay, well, this still isn't really like something I'm going to grow. Um, and I had the Panama property by that point in time. So I was going back and forth to Panama the Panama thing, I was just over eager on. I was just like really early and my property's still off the grid. Um, but I thought that would come around faster. And then, um, you know, it's hard. Transitioning's hard. I mean, we have a couple friends like from my generation, you know, like Jeremy Nobis um, is in jail right now. He's had like a lot of alcohol problems. And there's some other people who have just really had trouble transitioning and getting out of that party lifestyle too. Um, so I don't know. I cut. Yeah, I quit drinking for four years, moved to San Fran. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Just, just figuring out some kind of a reset. <laughs> and then eventually, how'd you find your way into the real estate stuff? Um, you know, I gotten lucky early on in some real estate stuff, just like when I was in college. Um, a girlfriend and I like put a down payment on a home and then rented all the rooms out. And like that, I should have, that was in Boulder. I wish should have kept that house. Um, <clears throat> but, um, and we sold it for a lot more money than we bought it for. And that, and then I just seen how that functioned. And, um, I was like, what should I be in? And then when I started, you know, looking at the Panama thing, um, I just, uh, was drawn in that direction. If I could go back in time, I would get my business. I would, I would get a business degree because as much as like I'm not attracted to being in the finance world, like if you're a free spirit, the one of the best things you can do is to like get your your MBA. I think to know uh, the rules, so then you know how. Yeah, to and you can study books. books. Like I've always read things, but um, I you know had I had like more of a yeah, I don't know. I'm a fr I've been pretty free spirited and independent and it just and had to learn just... all the things the hard way. Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, it just seemed like a good direction. And I, I like as a realtor, um, I dig representing clients and being in deals. They're challenging. Like I like to be, I like to get work through things. And for some reason I find like the intricacies of real estate interesting. Um, not that I'm obsessed by that, you know, work, but I enjoy being in it. And, um, and I really enjoy the development process. And I look forward to like where we're actually building because it is quite creative. We've designed, I've been working on this morning, like I've designed these like off grid homes that are just like super well thought out and really pay attention to energy use and, um, and uh, being like really just being very, ultra functional in an off grid situation, but also very, very comfortable. So like, I like that, like that's been a really fun design challenge to work with. And we're designing a hotel now, similarly, that's like a three story, eight room adventure, surf, um, yoga, fitness, hospitality flag. And, um, that's something I wish I would have started working on a long time ago. So how are you getting, you know, the, I don't want to say the kicks, but the kicks, you know, is, has there been something that replaces the feeling of, you know, being really scared on the top of a line and then having an incredible flow experiencing ski line? I still kind of do that. I, I do that. I still do that. I skied so much this year and like, you know, I'm just always breaking trail out of bounds. And then there's like some cooler, more, there's some more challenging um, lines I can see from right here that ski straight in and catch them. You know, that's very cliffy and 
Um, you know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, like the grumpy zone, and then there's some other zones. And so, like, I still get that. I still get that. And I feel like I could up level it and go to Alaska and probably, you know, get right I bet back. You could. Yeah, I enjoy it. I mean, I feel I still get that kick. That's amazing. And that's so yeah. cool to hear. And I did, but I'm not like standing on top of something that's ultra sketchy and I, you know, waiting for a cameraman to set up, which I think they have to do a lot less of these days. Um, and like, do you, I'm kind of like not even into being around helicopters. Like I loved it so much for so long, but like, you just not so into that whole vibe. Like it's fun just to get out there. And will you talk about that? Like the intensity of what, helicopters are and that sort of thing like you loved it and well they're great they're amazing machines and i i they're they're amazing machines um and you know we were flying into at times like sometimes we're flying in very windy like our dave swanwick and uh and um van shaw and i were almost in an accident and like a crash one time in new zealand so I mean, they're kind of, they can be they've, the safety standards that have gone up quite a bit, but um, you know, just getting out on a tiny little peak where and like actually like where the helicopter's doing like a hover landing in the wind, like <clears throat> all that was pretty in, pretty intense. <laughs> so I don't really miss that. Would you say you've had to do? I mean, a lot I loved of it, but I also know like now I'm a father, and um, would you know. say you had to do a lot of trauma work? post ski you know a little career. bit i feel like i had like a ptsd thing going on for a while um from so, that intense heli skiing and yeah performance and i mean i yeah. know you've been in at least one big avalanche but and like never said much about it yeah i mean i ended up on top it was a pretty big like cycle down I don't know. It wasn't that huge of a slope, but, um, and I didn't get buried. Um, but overall, like, yeah, I mean, I think I like looking back, I think I was in a constant state of like, like I was really treating my adrenals like through medicine, not necessarily, not like, uh, more like alternative medicine but I was, my adrenals were really tapped all the time. <clears throat> so I knew I was just like always stressing, like as fun as it was, like my body was in stress a lot, either from healing or just from like being out there and being in stressful situations, which I, which I fed off of for quite a while. But um, I was like, during my ski career, I was like treating a weak adrenal system and I'm um, always trying to like recalibrate at times and like get back in my body. Um, so I was, yeah, I mean, I didn't realize it at the time what it was from. I was just like, I don't know what's happening or why I have this, like why I have this um, anxiety or stress or whatever was coming up. And then like in retrospect, it was probably, you know, largely based on what I was doing, which is also maybe part of why I quit. I was just like, I just need to tone it down. Totally. <clears throat> But now, I mean, I know I can go into situations, well, with snow, just maybe it's just knowledge or you just know more about snow conditions and abbey conditions and things. And like other people I'm with are very stressed and I'm not stressed at all. And I'm, you know, kind of acting as the more knowledgeable guide in the group. Look at you now. <laughs> but it's not, it's not at that level of like that upper, upper high level of sketch. Yeah. You're just showing your friends around your backyard. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So when did the little girl come along? She, Kailani, was born in 2013. And so, you know, tell me that story. Well, <laughs> her <clears throat> I met her mom in Panama. And um, <clears throat> I don't know, and then we got pregnant. I don't want to go too much into that. But we're not together now anyway. But I, I really enjoy being a parent. And I have a very unique child who's lots of fun. She's a little bit autistic and um, she's diabetic, type one. So she's been like lots of fun. And then, you know, parenting's definitely, um, she's been a little bit challenging. 
I look back, like she has a little bit of trouble socializing with the, I think it's like part of the autism spectrum thing. Like she doesn't, she's kind of, a, she's a little immature for her age. She's really goofy. She, she's funny. She's tall. <clears throat> and then she's like kind of goofy and has like autistic things like repeating herself at times. Um, but she's really fun and she has a couple close friends, which is great. But, um, then last summer she came up, she has diabetes. So that's been like, it's pretty manageable now, but yeah, it's just stay on top of it. Kind of so older. what is it like to be a parent of a child with diabetes and with autism for people that don't, don't know about that? Um, so she has to have insulin anytime she has carbs, which is car, which is basically like that's it's on the label of the, uh, so sugar and carbs create glucose, uh, blood glucose levels in your body. And so if you're, if you're diabetic, your pancreas isn't working. Basically, there's like a T cell situation with type one. Type two, I think, is let more like people kind of ruin their pancreas um, generally. Type one is more like a genetic slash. They don't really know what it is, but her uncle on her mom's side has it. Um, and she has to have like she has to have insulin, which is what your body produces naturally with every every time she has carbs. So you, it's like more meal planning. And you got to watch her like a hawk as a little kid who puts everything in the mouth or like goes to a birthday party or whatnot. Wow. Yeah. Like you can't get it too high or too low. And she has a pump now. So it's, there's actually some intuitive aspects to it that help a lot. We just started that like two months ago instead of giving her shots all the time. And, um, but yeah, she has a pretty, she's like learned a lot on her own and knows how to, she's learning more and more about doing like taking care of things herself. And, from what I hear about autism, you also have special gifts, right? Like what? She is like, she's like, I imagine Shane McConkey would probably be considered to be on the autism spectrum. Um, had, you know, he, you know, now they have all these labels for neurodiversity, like ADHD and autism. But, um, and then I think I, after studying like ADHD and autism, like I see parts of those in me. And then also in many of my peers in action sports, I think it's probably pretty, I think those two things are probably pretty common um, in, in action sports. I don't know, or maybe during my generation for some reason, but like Seth Morrison um, as well. Um, socially, you know, like he's, I mean, not, now that I've studied these things a little bit, I would, I think he'd, probably be considered on the spectrum as well as, as well as me. And, and, and what are those things that you've studied? You um, know, like like, facial awareness, um, hyper-focus, like what? Yeah. Hyper-focus or, um, hyper-focus, it can be part of those or, or like ADHD. Um, and then like social awkwardness, um, which can lead to like drinking and partying at times or whatever, or, or, and then like, trouble was she has like she has good reading comprehension but she's like math like she like like logic situations with like math or it seems like maybe it's like a logic thing but for her that doesn't connect really well it's like a but, different language and then um you know she seems inclined towards certain things you know like elon musk is on, on the spectrum right they used to call it a. they keep changing all the labels but he he was he's called a. Oh God, what is it? I don't know, but they don't even use that name anymore of what the one that he is labeled as. But so you have like this, like there's like a genius aspect to it or like certain Spot. things people can excel at. Like he's kind of like Elon Musk is like a little, he's really funny if you follow him on Twitter, but he's also like very intelligent. Um, and then I think he's a little bit socially awkward. Like if you look at him on camera, like he doesn't make great eye contact a lot of the time. Um, but anyway, I don't know. There's just like neurodiversity, but anyway, so she is the hard part is she doesn't make friends really well, really easily, but she's like really loving and kind of naive and just, but she, yeah. So she's a little bit troubled by like that. She doesn't have as like more friends than she wished she did. Cause she, yeah. she's, this world is brutal. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise she has like so much love from, from me and like her mom and she has some close friends. So she's, she's like, seems okay. And she doesn't seem to give a shit. Like, she's just like, whatever. I don't really care. I mean, she's a part of her. And then, 
you know, sometimes she'll get sad about things, but for the most part, she's just kind of like, um, oh, doing whatever. Like the other, I don't know, the other day we were at, that's probably really boring for people. The other day we were at the party at the base of the ski mountain at River Run. And um, she was like playing with her friends. And then there's all these people and I'm trying to keep an eye on her because of the diabetes, because I want to check it and make sure she doesn't go low or make sure she doesn't do whatever so i you know i try not to go too long and i couldn't find her anywhere and then i found her i found her later and i was like where were you and she goes she's just like i was in the elevator and i was like yeah, what were you doing she's like i was just going up and down and pushing it's only two levels <laughs> she was in the elevator for like an hour she's like i was just hanging out in the elevator and meeting people and just doing that and i'm like all right like you know not so she you know gets into things that you know other kids might not be interested in doing She's yeah. a ripping skier. I mean, she she actually is a really bad racer. Like she hasn't done well in her races, but she skis really fast. And I took her into last year we went to Switzerland. I took her to Engelberg and I had like some bad parenting moments where I was like, uh, probably shouldn't have brought her here. But she's she just charges on steeps and doesn't make a real she makes a really good check turn, I can tell you that. It doesn't help in racing. <laughs> Anything else about parenting? You want to share? Um, it's fun. I don't know. It's like, um, it's been like, what is it? I didn't plan on it. And um, it's been very rewarding. I'm glad I waited until I was a little older. And um, yeah, I don't know. You just have a little being who's totally dependent on you. So it's, uh, it's fun, like witnessing their whole world and their uniqueness and I've been enjoying it. Has that motivated you in any different ways or? Um, it's taken like, it takes a lot of time and effort. It's get, it's, it's, it's made me, you know, it's made it, I'm glad she's getting more independent because it's made it like hard for me to focus on some like, especially like work things where I haven't had time or even like relationship situations. Um, it's been like a little, well, I'm in a really small town, but it's been like, a little trickier as a single parent, like definitely, you know, you have like the red flag of your, you have a child and you know, that's only appealing to not everyone, mm -hmm. but it's nice that she's older. Cause like, that's um, just in terms of like my work and everything else, um, she's just getting more independent, but yeah. Do you feel like you've become, you know, what, what differences do you see in yourself from the time when everyone knows you from to the man that you are now? Um, I'm better with kids, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's different? I mean, I've always been like a pretty, I've ha I haven't changed that much. I like, there's parts of me that I don't, there's like a more sensitive part of me that I don't tend to share as much at times. Um, but like with her, with parenting, like it's, fun. it's just great. Like you have to be really mindful and available for your children. Um, and that's like good learning. Um, honestly, her, to be honest, like her mom is incredibly difficult and, um, she's been just like a great teacher because like any trigger I ever had or, sense of like entitlement to have a certain view like i just have to deal with someone who's constantly in my life who's really like trying to push the buttons all the time and just stay chill about it whereas like i think i used to be more reactive which kind of like if you're going to go into like a whole psychological breakdown my dad was like pretty hard on me growing up which probably really helped me become like successful in skiing but also emotionally like i would i would either close down or just like push back you know, and so that was like one of my patterns for a long time and um, like hold my ground, you know, because I'd either just get like run over by him or I, you know, eventually like hold my ground and just say like, fuck you. So like that played out into my psychological makeup, at, you know, for a lot of my life. Um, and yeah, it's nice to be a parent and feel like you can do it better, you know, even do my I had great some great my parents also did like great they're were, they're were great in certain ways too like there's no black and white my mom was a really sweet person who i probably stressed to death she passed away but i feel bad like 
now I'm like, I wouldn't know if I want Kailan. Like if I had a child who was doing what I was doing, like that would make me, that would drive me crazy. <laughs> like I would be so afraid all the time. So my poor mom. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. I definitely had questions of, you know, about the role that your dad played, you know, and, uh, and I wonder too, if that was, can you share more of that story? Like, did he approve of your skiing or not? Do you feel like that added no. to your, right? He never approved. He never came to any premieres. Like he just was not involved. Like I wasn't in finance. And so like anything but finance isn't like a, wasn't like a worthy profession. Um, he, he had like, he was like, he, he was a good person to, to many, um, just for his children. He was like very single pointed and like what was worth your time and energy and what wasn't. And, um, he was very much like not involved or interested very much in my skiing which is probably what helped you be such a professional and like send it <laughs> yeah I, probably i mean there's like a whole um i was just i'm honestly i love skiing and i was having a good time but you I were did, determined like, to find success in i wasn't trying too. to prove anything to him i was just like well maybe i mean maybe there's some part in there well, to find like, success, you had to. You had yeah, to no, I grew up. up around like success being defined. He was very successful, and he was a, he was actually pretty pioneering as a as like in what he did. He was like a, a fun manager, but he um, was. But he was a first. teacher first, right? Yeah. How'd you know? Anyway, yeah, he was like a school teacher, but that was when I was like I was born in Kansas City, and I only lived there for nine months. School um, teacher for finance? Like, how do you go from a? No, he's a history teacher. He was a history teacher. I'll tell everyone out there, if you want to make money, go into finance. Because like finance is all designed to take money from everyone who invests and make more money off of it. And it's like a really good way to make a lot of money. <laughs> and I think like I know a couple guys who have like gone into finance early and then gotten out by the time they're like 35 and they basically can do whatever they want. And yeah, um, but that's the I would have done that guys, if my dad my dad finance. was so grumpy and he was like so tense all the time that it's like the last thing I wanted to do. Like he made it look completely unappealing, but I have some friends from high school or whatever that went into finance and they're great. They had like so much fun with it and they're great. They're way more fun people. They're not, you know, I don't think they got as stressed out all the time. Yeah, that but that's did. not everybody. I think there's also a lot of people that went into it, you know, with all those expectations and like 60 hour work weeks and yeah. it didn't happen for them. No, people get into it and get back out too. Like they just don't relate to the culture of it of i mean i guess there's it depends on where you are and what you're doing yeah i mean so yeah but i did i did like grow i did like have it instilled in me that you needed to be successful um so like that i appreciate and i you know on a different note like i talked to my yeah well i have i put no i don't really like yeah i don't know we'll see what happens with my child <laughs> yeah well thanks for sharing i mean all this yeah. is like super helpful and that is the intention of you know why we're sitting here today yeah i mean everyone has different backgrounds i know like shane's mom was like always really intense about kind of on that in a similar way with different things like it there's probably like something that's good about that you know having a that pushing right? parent yeah yeah. Uh, expectations. Yeah, to some degree. But now I have this child who's like, I'm like, I don't know how, I'm wondering what, what she's going to get into or what she's going to do. Yeah. So the, uh, another one of those names was Shane, you know, you've brought him up a lot. Anything else that people, it, everybody holds him in such high esteem, but maybe some things people didn't know about him. Um, I don't know. Like what? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Cause I've, I didn't, know. I didn't, I didn't hang out with him that much after for a while we hung out a bunch, but then he was so like off the wall and goofy and that like his whole, and he was actually kind of disrespectful. He'd like, he was really good at inappropriate comments, which were not 
I didn't appreciate super what well at times. Yeah. Like he would say like really inappropriate things like with He loved to make people feel awkward. Yeah. Um, which is like there's like a good part of that because like the that like Joker, it's good to like bring things down to earth, you know, and and like keep it light. Um, but um, to always know, have we to be close. We're like brothers, you know. Like we just didn't we didn't ha we kind of had different crews over time, and I hung out with like more. I don't know. I just had a different crew. Like I actually like my I had a couple guys from Squaw who are really amazing skiers, um, who were just like my. I would just go with them and they were, you know, one of them is a painter still is. And that was just like, <clears throat> I don't know. I just, we just had different like crews certain ways. He was definitely hung out with Gaffney a ton and um, other people. And then I was like kind of more, I actually kind of, par I might've had, I probably was like more into partying to be honest than he was. Um, so I was kind of always looking for like the next good time and good party and, <laughs> um yeah i don't know and then like you know back then like even though the tgr thing like we have so much fun but like those guys like we were all in this really intense like hey let's go out and crush it super hard like harder than anyone is um whereas some of the other like crews like more like msp were probably you know they're a little more like hey let's go keep doing this and have fun and have a good time and the back then like it for part of it i mean god we were i guess i'm jumping around it's probably not that much difference to be honest but I don't know what in terms of Shane, uh, do I have any, I don't know. I don't really have any dirt on him. That's all right. What we about had, like, fun? We had, a. I gave this picture to Sherry. I just, I had this great picture of Shane smoking a joint from our first trip in, uh, Switzerland when we were doing those Nick Nixon movies. Like he has like this joint in his mouth. We were hanging out with these Swiss with these awesome Swiss crew and getting super stoned, but you know, <clears throat> <clears throat> um he wasn't a stoner though i'll tell you like neither was seth like none of us really smoked weed and i know weed for some people is like a really big part of the culture but it, it wasn't for us um there was for other people around us but um we weren't we weren't uh i've never been like a, a real uh marijuana lover but you said you like to party. So do you mean like drink? Well, we used to drink a lot. And then we do like, I mean, I, yeah, I drink. And then like when I quit drinking, when I went to San Francisco, I would, I just, um, I do like more like psilocybin, um, <clears throat> which is not such a like, um, it seems like with weed, like people who do weed, like do it a lot, like every day, often like for most of the day. Whereas like, um, with psilocybin it doesn't really have that hook like it's more of like a, oh i'm gonna do this tonight and then you like you know it's not like an everyday thing so i've I, heard uh, that that <clears throat> it, it actually does change your neuroplasticity and and in some cases like has helped has helped with transitions would you would you say yeah that? well no i've read they're doing some great some amazing studies on it that i've heard of i haven't read them but i've you know i listened to rogan who joe rogan has some great discussions on on um hallucinogenics i think he also smokes a lot of weed but um he um but there's been some great um studies and i've well i've seen other things on them too but apparently like they're saying like macro dosing and um what does that mean like it leaves like taking like a big dose like where you actually where you go pretty deep um they're saying like they're doing like two macro doses is like curing people of depression yeah um which is of no interest to the pharmaceutical industry, although they apparently there's like quite a few pharmacological studies going on it, but it, I don't expect them to get behind it because they don't want people to be cured. They want people to be hooked on something they need to take all the time. Hmm. Yeah. I love all the roads we've gone down. Um, you know, we talked before about you've gotten into crypto. You've like made all the mistakes in crypto. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I've done pretty well in crypto um, at times. Do you want to share about that at all? Um, Just like the story of like, because you were there at the beginning. Once yeah, again, it was early, it was else. tough. I lost tons of crypto because like it was hard to store it and it was hard to keep track of it. And it would be like on a, <clears throat> when that early, like there was that early exchange that got hacked 
And like, I had a whole bunch of crypto. Like, if I had all of my crypto that I ever bought, I'd be like so retired. Supposedly, right now. like thirty-five percent of all crypto has been lost forever. Have you heard? Probably. That? Um, but um, yeah, I followed it. I mean, I've been. I got it early. I saw what it was, and I liked it because the cool thing about crypto that people don't get is like, it's the early vision was that it's super liberating, right? Like, it takes the middleman out takes the bank out of the equation which is all these people in finance all these people that are basically just like make well i don't want to diss people who are in finance because they're they're really providing a service to people but they're making like absorbent amounts of money off your money and giving you a small cut to help you feel good about what you're making um and even and then banks are a whole different story and like the federal reserve and how corrupt like the history of the fed and like that they're you know it gets into like i mean you can go down a big rabbit hole right in terms of like um what would be what people call conspiracy theory um with federal reserves and how that's actually a private bank and everything else but like the fed and the way the banking system works um and the like the cool thing about crypto and the reason why i guess like it was used somewhat on the black market is like you're basically exchanging peer-to-peer -peer. and so there's like this incredible amount of like financial liberation that comes out of it um and you just don't you don't need those intermediaries yeah uh, the dream of it is awesome and then the mechanics in between are, are complicated yeah and so the sketchy thing is that they're probably going to come out with like a national crypto and the mm -hmm. thing about cryptos is you can you can design it and even with even with bitcoin and other ones like you can you can basically like track it so like they're going to come out with a national currency most likely and it's going to make it possible like tulsi gabbard is speaking out heavily against this right now she's someone who's in politics who i really like but um <clears throat> basically like they'll be able to track like everywhere you spend your money there's it leaves a trail of all your sure. spending and so like if you're using that nationalized crypto like that's what it's going to be but at the same time there's all these other cryptos and like there's a it's such as i mean there's so much scammy shit out there but there's a couple um i lost money that way for sure <laughs> yeah the, i lo i've tried some different things that, where i've lost some money if you're going to use an exchange use a um, kucoin in korea super reputable they're off the radar like coinbase and crypto.com is they just they're just pulling money off everyone and they don't even have a browser version like crypto.com i don't like at all coinbase is like great you have to onboard your money some way if you're you know you got to put your dollars in some way so like you need coinbase to get in and out but don't like trade on coinbase or use you know just take your money and put it in kucoin kucoin's awesome it's in korea it's like they're still trying to figure out how to tax crypto like they haven't figured out what to do with it and so the thing that the, the structure that they have around it now doesn't make any sense so like realistically like they should be taxing people when they onboard or offboard their money into dollars all the stuff that happens in between they're trying to say like every time you sell a crypto you should be taxed on it but like the numbers are changing so fast and everything it's like if you're it's be impossible to track but and if you're on coinbase or someone like that like they're like tracking all your data and they're like reporting to the irs and like the the, the thing is is like i i believe in paying taxes the problem is they just don't know what to do with it yet and so like if i put money in through coinbase it's going to go somewhere else and then if it comes off through coinbase then that's my then that's something that you can like apply you know a tax basis to but i can't believe they keep like not figuring out what to do with it like they've had so much time and they keep just seem to be blowing it off and then yeah i don't know but anyway it's a really fun it's an interesting industry and like the way that it can be used with smart contracts and now with nfts and like all the different like parts of it that can be used and the other thing is just like um uh d uh, defi decentralized finance um it like liberates it liberates like your use of money and it it makes you like question how taxation should even work
right? Like we pay taxes. Every time we buy something, we're paying tax. Like everything's taxed over and over and over again, right? It's like multiple layers of taxation. It's like they almost need to just tax like in what do you call it? Independent. What are we income tax? Individual income tax should probably just not be taxed because we're always paying and then they should just tax like set businesses more because that's trackable. But like once you get into all this crypto stuff, like individual income tax, like they just don't, there's no, it just seems so uncontrollable and there's no way to deal with it. And it's, it's sort of like inevitable that it's happening. Um, so where do you see it going? Um, I don't know. I just like it. Like if you're using crypto, like I can take a payment. I don't do this yet. Panama is crypto friendly, by the way. Um, but I could take a payment. <clears throat> I could send money to myself without it costing me anything, you know, a theater, like the, with certain, with the cryptos that don't cost gas fees. Um, Cardano, by the way, is my favorite crypto for years and years now. They've just, it's, it's um, open source. Um, and it's just like the whole design of it is the best, is in my opinion, like far superior, but um, you know, I can like send my, <clears throat> I could theoretically, send myself money in Panama. Whereas like now I have to go into the bank, I have to pay my bank 45 bucks to send a wire. The receiving bank charges me another 30 bucks. It costs me like $75 every time I wire myself money in Panama, which is pretty frequently um, from one bank, from one Kent Kreitler bank account to another. And like, it just takes out all that skimming that goes on in the middle. Um, the problem is like we do need to be taxed because for all of our social services and th like all the things that we enjoy about what our taxes pay for that we do enjoy that we agree with um so you know they, they have some work to do to figure out how it's all going to work thanks for sharing that you know i think uh it's funny that uh you say you're not in finance but you are in finance absolutely oh well, yeah that's really it's it was a really fun space for a long time because it was so renegade. I dug it and like now it's like more mainstreamed and it's different. But Do you it was see any like, other parallels? Parallels? <laughs> oh, you mean with <laughs> me? I get attracted to things that are like fringy and like progressive for sure. Like and I then love once they're somewhat mainstream. You're like, nah, it was fun back in the day. <laughs> yeah, it was fun when it was cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I get. Uh, I'm like a. I'm like a. You know, I imagine like the guys, the people who used to get on ships and sail across to ancient. I mean, not to ancient, to other lands. You know, like it's that same mentality, like the pioneering mentality. And so, that was my favorite thing about the skiing. One of my favorite things about skiing was like not like skiing and my ability to ski and learning new things was like, we pioneered like the Haynes range in Alaska and like a bunch of stuff around Valdez where you're like, no one's ever skied it before. And there's no like, human has ever stepped. No foot. humans even set foot. And we named all that we named, like, yeah. I don't know. We named 40 legitimate peaks, not to mention like lines, but I mean, that's, that was like, I love, that was cool. Yeah. And so that's what I did in Panama too, is like, I got, which is like, I keep like biting off more than I can chew. Um, but, and now it's finally coming around, but that's been like a 17 year vision of like, how do you present, like, for me, it's like creating this green community part of it. Cause a lot of it's going to be off grid and, and low energy use. Um, and between you and me, like, I'm not a soup, I'm not like really big on the whole global warming thing. Um, I don't, I don't really, I don't really buy it. Um, I think we're probably just in some kind of a natural cycle. And even if we're not, we've been, the earth has been through like eons of highs and lows. But I also think like in terms of pollution and energy use and everything else, it's still good to be green and to like lower your footprint. So, um, like this property is so cool. And I, I somehow I, by the fate of whatever I ended up with it. Um, but I do like the idea of community. And like, the other thing is like these ski towns have gotten, I'm jumping around on this, but the ski ski town living has gotten so expensive. Like mm -hmm. a lot of us are looking for like, what's the next place or where can I go to afford to live or where can I retire to? Like, 
because you know am i going to be able <clears throat> maybe if panama plays out well i can afford the like three million dollar base for a home and catch them now but you know like otherwise like think of all of my friends and everyone else and i've sold like so i've sold some early properties to several ski uh friends and like you know i feel like a lot of us are like okay well if i can go somewhere and surf and and have a home somewhere that's in it like if i can be in a resort ish like zone that has that those great natural natural attributes and where i have community um you know what's out there and so like i think like something what i'm doing like i'd love to see a lot of people who are you know involved as our friends in the ski industry get it uh buy into it <clears throat> Yeah. I love it. Thanks for sharing that vision because I think um, everyone is sort of looking for like, you know, what do you want to create in this life with this life? Is it? How I know we all want to create, you know, and um, so it's weird with real estate too because it's like how much is left and like what is you know, 50 years from now, like what is left to develop or, you know, you can always redevelop. But um yeah, who knows? Who knows where the where the planet's going? Apparently, the population's dropping. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that's strategic and somehow natural in a lot of different ways. Yeah, it seems like. Yeah. Anyway, that's a big yeah. discussion. Um, so there's one more thing. Two, a couple more things. I know you want to probably go. It's been a long time. This is one of my longest podcasts, but I think you know, it's worth it. So. so mm -hmm. If, were you gonna? Were you gonna say you gotta go? No, I'm good. I okay, mean, good. I should go, but I don't. Okay, good. What were you gonna say that I cut you off then? <clears throat> what? No, I'm good. I'm okay. Okay, I'm so the one of the reasons I've always wanted to have you specifically on this podcast is you have always had this spiritual side, and um, I've heard in in like interviews at one point you sort of allude to that a little bit. And obviously this path, um, a, one time you had an Eagle show up at a competition and, and that was really prophetic to you in some way. Like, would you, you know, share that, you know, whatever that is to you and what that draw that is part of you? Um, I am one of those people who is just attracted to finding out what is really going on at an early age. So part of that was like, I'd read books about crystal vibrations, you know, like everything, everything's energy. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I don't have like many crystals in my house, but I do feel like when you start to find like a concentrated source of energy, <clears throat> like a crystallization of something, it's going to have like a, a vibration, right? Everything has vibrations. Yeah. It's um, not rocket science really. Yeah, it's not. Um, and then it's, and so like for me i i, I like i just kind of got attracted to things early and i wasn't i i did like some church time when i was a kid but i wasn't really buying into the god story um that didn't really resonate with me um like the omnipotent man god <laughs> um so um and then it's like even if you go like even if you go camping, like anyone who spends time in nature, it's like you look at like how vast and like, it like how, what a like miracle or how unique it is that we're even here. I mean, I was just listening to this. Elon Musk has this great interview that he just did over the last two days on, um, you know, like people who are super blue are going to think I'm crazy. But on Tucker Carlson, who I actually really enjoy because I don't enjoy everything he says, but he does some really good like reporting on things that are real but he has a great anyway musk is talking about human consciousness and so they're talking about ai as part of that but i mean it's so unique that we have consciousness and, and that we have and it's at such a high level compared to all the other animals around us right we have this like uniquely ultra high level of consciousness and so like why the hell are we here and then like how do we like from what we know of the universe um like it's just like it's such a trip to, for lack of a better word like it's just so crazy that we're here so like why are we here um so that can lead you into spirituality and so anyway i've been attracted to like different phases of things i had um i had a shaman teacher through my 20s 
very much during my ski career who I do vision quests with. And that was like, a lot of that's around like emotional healing and, and like, but some of it is around like archetypes, like his, uh, his philosophy was that there were like four main human archetypes, the visionary, the healer, the teacher and the warrior. So he would like bring awareness to that, um, spectrum. And then I was really into like animal medicine and like, so, or I was into like, or I still, I still enjoy that. And like what sort of energy or archetype an animal brings to our awareness, like what they might embody energetically. Right. That's like uh, animal totem card kind of stuff. And um, so that's been like part of it. And then I got very attracted after doing that for like 15 years. And like the, the, the vision quest work is like he, we didn't do medicines, medicines, which I enjoy medicines quite a bit. Um, but I, I was going back to microdosing and things like that. Like those are That's a great discussion in itself. Um, by the way, with the medicines, like I feel like all those plant medicines, like I feel like they uh, alter your perceptions in such a way that we like for me it comes down to like we have sense perceptions and so we basically are like built for survival on the planet if you want to look at it at, the, at this level and like we're perceiving energy in a certain way that helps us um like survive live feed ourselves etc but like the thing about the plant medicines that's interesting is aside from their like inner work you can do on trauma and, and whatever else um they give you a perception of what energy might look like in a different form, you know, right? Like if you're doing a really heavy like LSD trip or, or, or psilocybin, like you're going to see what we consider hallucinations, but you might just really be perceiving energy in like a, a way that our sense perceptions aren't normally aligned with. But anyway, so you can go into that as like a spirituality thing. Um, but I feel like those, I don't feel like that's like what I, if you take like a, a, a medicine, a plant medicine, I don't think you're seeing reality as it really is. Like a lot of people be like, Oh my God, I saw how it really was. Or I felt the oneness aspect, which is maybe related into where I'll get with this. But um, I just think you're seeing energy in a different way or perceiving. And I think you do open, like if you do have like that, we're all one thing going on. That feeds into where I'm going, which is that I got really attracted into Buddhism, like Mahayana Buddhism and the concept of emptiness and like the the negation, the the lack of the inherent nature of things being the ultimate nature of things like we're labeling machines. So anyway, when I went to my first Buddhist teaching, which was um, the the. Was it the Diamond Cutter Sutra? Wait, the lack of inherent. Say that again nature of things we we assign oh. inherent inherency by Got labeling it. things we label this as a pencil but and we see it as a pencil but if you look it's not inherently a pencil it's got this lead thing in the middle it has this red covering it has this eraser and like if you break it down into the parts then it's no longer a pencil it's not it's it's like then it's just like this part and then if you take the eraser and you take this blue out of it, then it's like blue and some rubbery substance. And then if you take the rubbery substance, you break that down more. So we just label things as like a thing. But if you break them down further, you there's just there's no inherent quality. Like there isn't an inherent essence coming out of it. It's you're you're putting that. That's you projecting. So we're projecting our entire reality, right? We're projecting this reality by labeling things, which makes it make us feel safe. But so Buddhism goes back to this concept of like the emptiness of things being the ultimate reality of things, which apparently like is aligned with on a tantric level, it's aligned with bliss. Um, like if you're in a state of seeing emptiness directly, you're in a state of bliss, like your winds are in your central channel. This gets into Tantra. <clears throat> so I've studied tantric Buddhism. Now I studied the open teachings for a long time you get into the inner body stuff, but it all comes back to emptiness, which is really what is the important uh, part of it. But anyway, so I got attracted. So I started learning this lot and then I, I started learning, like it's very much supported by the, like the logic I just gave you. And so like 
on a spiritual level, I really liked like something being explained logically to me instead of just saying, Hey, there's this, you know, God out there or whatever. Um, so anyway, yeah. So then I went on, so then I've been on like a Buddhist thing and like with the Buddhist like container, like all that other shit fits into it anyway, like all those other realities and like, you know, multiple realms happening at the same time. Like our consciousness is like constantly just moving between realms. Like now I'm in a human body and like, I've probably been in an animal, animal, some, you know, multiple eons of times. So it's like, basically the idea is that your consciousness is always moving, but then like, if you practice well and understand the nature of reality, well, you can like achieve Buddhahood, right. And become a Buddha. And that, so that's what, that's what Shakyamuni Buddha was teaching, but there've been, but then there's like a lot of other people who have achieved Buddhahood once you're in Buddhism. But anyway, I got, I got kind of, that became my master. <laughs> that became my master spirituality. So if we're talking about spirituality and then like, I kind of dove too far into that. And then I realized I had like more personal work to do, like even just through like my last breakup or whatever. And I was like, you know, there's always like the self, like the self improvement. You can go into what's what I would, you know, what people call spiritual bypass. Like you're, you're so into your spiritual thing that you're not even like paying attention to what an asshole you're being. So, the, or whatever, or your trauma, or your trauma, or like, so like, there's like the two sides of it where it's like ultimate reality and like your personal work. So like, in terms of like my spirituality, I think it's like, it's kind of like, it's kind of anything. And then like, the ta if you have tantric view, which I'm, you know, like, everyone's horrible at practicing the religion, or not everyone, many of us. But like a tantric view is you view everyone as your teacher, like everyone is like, you kind of can say everyone's already enlightened and everyone's a teacher, even if they're coming at, if they're coming at you, like, uh, in a, in a harsh way, like a Yamantaka teacher, like that's still a teaching, even if it's like the asshole who's over there, like there's something to be learned from that. So like, it's a I cool, say, it's I a cool religion because you're supposed to be learning all the time from everyone around you. And then it comes down to the emptiness of things. And because emptiness is like a blank, because, because of emptiness, there's karma. And so like whatever you're putting out there is naturally coming back to you in some way. So that's where the whole like Buddhist karma thing comes in. Anyway, logically it all makes sense to me. So I like it. Whereas like so much other stuff is like, you know, me, now they're reading crystals with energy reading radion, whatever they're called. And then you can like, people are like, there's ways to like read different energies or, or maybe someone can photograph like a, a, a ghost entity through some photographic process. I don't know. There's like different science things that are, that are interesting and in proving like that phenomena are function in different ways. Everything's phenomena. But then like from a Buddhist perspective, you would say like, ultimately you're projecting the same way I'm projecting the label of pencil onto this thing. I'm projecting everything. It's really well said. Projecting you. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm projecting you and, and this whole story. And, you know, there's a projection of this thing that we call skiing and this industry and these stories. And, and in the end, it's all nothing. And, but why not have fun with it while we're here? If and we then can... like yoga is really good for yoga is like a deep, like a tantric practice. Um, like for so a does month. That, would you say, cause I don't know a lot about tantra. Would you define it as in the body practice? Yeah. It's like an inner, you're like affecting your inner body. And so like, and there's, a, there's, there's people who apparently, I mean, you go on faith, but like a lot of yogis, like they'll see if you meditate well and like at, you, you actually like apparently there are those who actually like see ultimately how those things work. Right. If you, if you do the practice, but you know, I can go into a yoga class and I can, I come out feeling really good, you know, and apparently like it's, it's like really kind of stretching out your inner body and your, your chakras and your, your energy channels. And like, we know about, we know energy channels are, are real because of like acupuncture maybe, or, or for other, or in other ways. But um, one thing, I, the reason I was, getting into that is like I find that skiing like when my prana 
like you say, your butt, your energy, like you feel really vital and blissful, like skiing really, I feel like skiing is such a blessing for all of us because that's one of the things we're attracted to is like the bliss and the prana, right? And the awareness that comes from it. So I think skiers are all pretty, like have, have a good karma to be skiers, right? <laughs> what are we, 1% of the world's population or something? Maybe more, I don't know. Maybe less. But it's like a really high karma, right? To be a skier. What do you mean a high karma to be a skier? Well, because you have that, you've like been, you have the karma to have that bliss all the time. So you've like done something good in the past. That's what karma means? Like, tell me about well, karma. Karma's like the, learning about that. Well, it gets into like that whole discussion on emptiness. But if you're like, if the world is like, basically, if like, if you're living, if everything's neutral and you're projecting your reality, then like logically anything you put out, which has to do with intention, like there's whole religions, like the religion of Wayne Dyer that revolves around the power of intention. And so the power of intention is real in so much as like, if I say, if I do something with intention, like if I give this pencil to someone who who's like my um if i if someone says hey can i borrow your pencil and i'm like i fucking hate this guy but i'm just gonna let him use this fucking pencil so he gets off my back it the i would the karma would be much better if i was like yes and i hope this pencil helps bring you like some kind like i hope whatever you're using this for is going to bring you like your greatest good All right so like that is how intention would work into creating karmas for yourself but you'd have to to like i'm not going to say i understand karma clearly but like if you get a grip on on emptiness that then it then it makes more sense that the energy that you put out comes back to you yeah that's great thank you so much you know i think in all my studies around karma it's always like this bad thing oh, you have karma, you don't want karma. And in, in that way, you just explained it as, it sounds to me like it's just the energy. If there's if there's emptiness, then if you're putting energy through the empty vortex, it's going to come back to you just in these different forms that look like separation again from us. Yeah. All the other Depending people or situations or whatever. I would also say it's like a learning world, right? And And some of those biggest teachers are our biggest struggles or the biggest people's challenges in our life Learned yeah, that right. really more than more than i'd like but i can see that i'm starting to understand to see the gifts in in all that all the struggle <laughs> yeah we have like we have so many triggers right or things that we wish you know there's other thing is like we spend so much time being like, oh, I wish that person was more like me in some way. Or I wish that, you know, or, or like, or what am I trying to say? Like, we don't know want to be like, we all like, let's just go into politics. It's good that we have different views. Like if everyone thought the same way, I feel like as humans, like we're always, we always want to be like, generally, like we want to have some kind of independence anyway. So I don't know, I think it's just good to appreciate your independence. Um, but in terms of like that discussion, um, you just appreciate the people who trigger you. And ultimately, uh, instead of fighting with them so hard, like find some common ground and, you know, try to have a relatively healthy discussion about your differences. I feel like things are so polarized now. Yeah, very attempting to be black and white when this world is gray. Right, or what? I don't know if it's gray. Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, it's like everything in between. It's the rainbow, yeah. right? Like, well, yeah, are, I mean, everything's very black. People are very black and white about trying it. to be black and white, but this world is the rainbow. Yeah, and we go like we align ourselves, like we like to be in tribes. I mean, I, the skier, the ski tribe's awesome, you know, and then like politically we try to we jump into these like red or blue tribes and like not everything's ideal about either one mm -hmm. or a lot of people do i consider myself more of a moderate 
on that front. But I mean, most, a lot of people are like, you know, I have to be in this group. Therefore I have to believe everything they say. Yeah. And it's all about diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of all things. Yeah. Foods, everything. Um, yeah, I once heard you say in your acceptance speech from the Ski Hall of Fame 2022, congratulations. Um, thanks to my family for letting me be the wild one. What yeah. The wild, I don't, uh, I think a lot of people who are professional skiers probably relate. <laughs> Um, are you still the wild one? Like, do you have an outlet for that? Did you like, have it? That's why I like wonder if I'm how, how like quote autistic I might be or whatever, but I just like, I'm just always been, you know, I pierced both my ears when I was 14 and that just felt like the right thing to do. I've just always been more punk rock. I've been pretty free spirited to be honest. And like a lot of people are more restricted by cultural norms. And I've like found, I've found like a common ground where I can like re be relatable and be, that's another thing about my transition out of skiing, I would say, but I, I needed to make myself more relatable to people outside of my, you know, that small spectrum. You needed to try to fit in? Well, just not try to fit in so much as be conscientious of their needs around me, right? So there's, that's a different way to look at it, right? Just being more caring of people and like where they are versus being so independent all the time. And like, this is, you know, my way is really fun. You should try it and try to be like this, but you know, everyone's different. So. Um. That sounds very mature of you. <laughs> yeah. Especially for someone who, like you were saying, it sounds like one of your gifts is that you could be so determined and focused and kind of had that, I don't care who gets it or I don't care who. Yeah. Well, that's the problem, not, right? Blessing and a curse. I mean, that's yeah. The that's problem the problem and the gift, right? It helps you do what you did in terms of pioneering and it makes you, you know, difficult. It's you can find you can if you're really if you're in rock and roll i'm thinking of like the one profession that i can think of if you're in rock and roll it can work really well for you because you can actually make money and succeed and you can be totally independent uh if you're i'll just call it out right now if you're if you're tanner hall or me or seth or i mean seth i've tried to get a hold of him he's apparently completely checked out in france somewhere and you know, that's great. I hope he's, I really hope he's well. Um, and, uh, you know, he probably is, but like, if you're going to be like functioning in society, like you, I was like very much in that realm of like, I can do whatever I want and be whoever I want to be. And like, and it's inspirational to people too. There's a really good side of it because it inspires people to be, the, to be authentic and be themselves at the same time. Like, you know, you even see it, you see it in rock and role and other things too, where people mature into being like, okay, I'm going to make myself more culturally available than I've been for this period of my life <laughs> or mm. during my twenties or whatever it is when you're, you know, when we go on those wild independent journeys, you know, then you get into like, what's that, what's that book? Like Homer, the Iliad. It's like this, I don't know. It's something we studied in high school, but it's like the life journey, right. the, the different archetypes you go through as you mature through life. Right. And so like, I feel like I'm, you know, hopefully becoming more of a wisdom elder now where you're, you know, you have, to, you have to be more relatable to a broader spectrum of people after going out and doing your thing and maybe being less relatable for a while. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 Thanks for, uh, I mean, just being you, you had to be, it sounds like that's, that's who you're always going to be. I love it. Um, let's see. I did want to know what the, the serious injury was. Oh, how you came back from it. Yeah. I, um, well, I did, I tore my leg off at the knee. Basically my, my tib fib was like this, right? Like my, my whole plateau came apart and all the tape, all the ligaments and tendons tore. So like, hopefully that would be inspirational to people. Like I healed that completely. But and I had and what was that story? That was in 2004. And um, 
yeah and they i had a, like the whole patella tendon in front of the knee tore in half like it was just was shirts. that filming or was it what was it yeah we were filming but i wasn't it was weird like we were filming and i was with skogan it was me and skogan and we were doing an early we we're doing like a january alaska trip so there's like a six hour window of light it was a really cool time of year to be up there and i it was great i don't know why people don't do more of that in fact you can probably get like good deals on heli time that time of year who needs to ski for more than six hours anyway um but anyway we were we were just doing like some i just jumped off this thing that was like a little like we we're on our way down and i was like hey let's shoot this and it, i didn't really pay that much attention to it it was just careless and i just i hit i landed on i like didn't clear the whole cliff band and i'm not really sh even sure what happened even in reviewing the film and my my leg came apart completely at the knee and i you know and i luckily i didn't damage the meniscus and i don't want to but that seems to be something that gives people more trouble in the long term mm -hmm. but all the tendons and ligaments and you know once again like i just go into like warrior healer mode and just was like that was just my i've I don't want to be injured again because like it it, it takes like so much focus, but I, I, I guess I'm the kind of person who has that like focus where I'm like, I'm just going to be, I was like, I'm just going to get back. I'm new in my mind. I get back to a hundred percent. Like I never, I don't quit. I'm not like, I don't give up. I don't give up. I'm like very, what's it? resilient and persistent, which has been like comes across if you don't manage that well, you're kind of harsh, you know, but like I'm very resilient. And so I've learned to be like very resilient and also be, you know, more soft too. But if you that, don't manage that, it comes off harsh. I don't, I don't get it. Oh, if you're just super resilient, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's not. I was just, you know, I just was, I'm just a resilient. I just was like, my frame of mind was that I'd heal it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas I think, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there who would who would just say I'm going to be handicapped now. Um, but I, you know, I part think, of your gift. Yeah, I think you can heal. I mean, we all have like, ever, I mean, I see even with Kailani's diabetes, like people have health challenges in life, and like there's those those are things to let to learn from or overcome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Eventually we die. You can't overcome that, but thank goodness. I know. Yeah, I just I pay it's a lot of attention. I pay a lot of attention to my health. Yeah, yeah. You can tell it's awesome. I'm really I'm inspired to do that. I want to live, I want to have like a really like healthy body and and mind, hopefully. Yeah, that we're stuck in that forever. We gotta like that's something that matters. I I hear my baby outside, uh, but I've gotta leave us okay. with like uh, like one of your favorite lines, uh, moments of flow. Oh God. I mean, I had so many this year. Love I don't it. know. I just, I'm always good. Stri I always. I mean, there's like lines where you're like, that was a, gr that was an accomplishment, you know, or, um, I can't think of like anything in particular. It feels like every, every time, you know, now I just want to ski. Pow I'm mostly skiing powder now, which I really, yeah. That's, that's enough. enough. That's good enough. But I like getting out there. I like being away from people. Like I like I like it when there's like an app, like there's like some mitigation risk to deal with and things to think about. What about like the most pr the proudest line? I mean, the Hall of Fame thing was like just getting up there on the stage and talking. And like realizing what, it, by the way, I want to circle back that like Shane's been inducted and Doug, but like, I felt like I was like the, you know, I'm living. Uh, I felt like I was like, you know, from my, the, for the, I feel like I, I feel like I will, I would like to be consider myself to be a representative of the modern, both big mountain and freestyle, like ski movements. And I felt like I was really honored to be, put in and I was glad that they did it. And I know there's other people from our discipline that got in there ahead of me. Um, but I feel like 
yeah, it was just such a killer honor. And I really was like feeling like I was kind of representing our disciplines in the sport too. So and you're I'm saying, sure they did. That's just how I felt. That was in my own space with it. So you're saying that has been your proudest moment over all the lines. I got to say, like, there's a lot of, th I didn't think I got the, um, as, as well as I did, I didn't think I got the credit I deserved a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and I felt like that, like, validated me in a way that I really wanted to be validated um, and gave me due credit. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so I, glad because, great. yeah. It was really cool. Love it. Love it. Cool. Um, <clears throat> go for it. Life is not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> right. You can listen to Kreitler's speech. Um, I could probably put all, I mean, there's so many favorite ski lines that I, I researched, you know, in preparing for this that I, I'll, I'll, I'll put links somewhere. Do you have any favorites? Myself? Of course. Oh, of yours? I, yeah, I don't know. I can't. Dude, there's so many just like beautiful turns, like fucking gorgeous, good <laughs> skiing. <laughs> so many. Um, and just graceful and powerful and uh, your eyes are in the right place. You know, like it, it I, I recognize now that maybe the industry never really cared if you were really good because no, not many people can tell the difference as long as you can get down something or do a triple backflip. Um, so I don't know that um, as a whole it's it's that valued generally, but to me it, it it's art. And uh, yeah. I don't, I don't watch all the artists. <laughs> yeah, there's so. a lot. So I really, uh, I mean, I wanted to always ski beautifully and power <clears throat> and powerfully. And, um, and you sent it and you made it look so easy and you never like, you guys all just had this mentality, um, that we all, you know, have continued to attempt to emulate and never be able to touch. <laughs> uh, there's a, I did. I, yeah. I mean, there's other people who I feel like were, are, I mean, there's people who I wanted to, who I learned. Well, there's, well, there's two people. There's several, but there's not that many. Well, Scott Schmidt had like really beautiful style. Everybody wanted to ski like Scott Schmidt. We still do. <laughs> yeah. I, I just skied with him. Gordy Pfeiffer. I like, follow, <laughs> I like following Scott. He's like, Everybody and Rob Delorey. Oh, Rob Delore is a beautiful skier. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of people that people don't know their names. I know, like you said, you ski with um, with somebody like we probably don't know his name. He's a painter, and one of my favorite ski Whitey. partners is a is a, a mechanic. Yeah, uh, a shipwright yard. You know, like um, that's that's the best part about it. One of them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and then yeah, it's fun for all the skiing youth. Like, enjoy your enjoy your friends and your crew. Like we had such good, I had such good crews, like, especially like my squaw park crew and, you know, my TGR crew and just like all or just your things. weekend warrior. Crew or anyone like, you, be on the you know, some of us, it's hard to see some of those people at times because we're in different places, but um, those are, you know, those are when you have, when you're free and in your twenties and like enjoying it just yeah it's, well you make those crews with anyone you go skiing with you know you, if it's if you have yeah, a, an true. experience off a chairlift or i know it happens all the time in the back country, if you have an experience you connect and that's one of the best things about it too is this social aspect of them first it really brings out who you really are and then uh if you have a if you if you get a little scared together you you have a bonding experience the hard, the hardest. Uh, you probably, you probably. I don't know how if you experience this, but one of the the thing with me is like I got whenever I meet people, or especially like younger kids who are who are really good skiers. Like the dude, everyone puts their fucking A plus game on with me. <laughs> it's like that must be hard. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like, can we just chill out a little bit? Slow, slow down. <laughs> I know you're really good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then I'm like, I, I, then I'm like, okay, I gotta like, I gotta throw down. I gotta keep up. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. But uh, yeah, I am like hesitant to get out. I've skied with, um, you know, some local guys who are 
pretty well known and they the the kids around here shred super hard yeah yeah, yeah. they really do i hope um <clears throat> i can't wait to see what i'll let you go all right my friend thanks. i'm gonna i'm gonna train i'm gonna so i'm gonna one of these years i'm gonna train super hard and do a segment again yeah Maybe i think after this you're gonna get invited to do that yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. i think we'd all love to see that uh, that'd be fun hell yeah all right well, thanks, Kreitler. Thanks for all the teachings, the lessons. Thanks for being a unicorn. And um, everybody who showed up, uh, yeah, thanks for joining. That's what it's all about. Cool. Thank you. Adios. I'll let you shut me down. I don't know how to, do, I don't know what I'm doing. Yet. I guess I don't really either. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for Done. joining, friends. See you next time. <laughs>